safe and it's a fun one. And I'm not entirely sure whether alcohol should play a large part in that. Thank you. We now move to the next out of business, which is a motion on motion number 12316. In the name of Angela Constance on raising attainment, members who wish to speak in the debate should press the request to speak buttons now. And I'll give a few moments for the front benches to change seats. I now call on Angela Constance to speak to and move the motion, Cabinet Secretary, about 14 minutes. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, our education system is improving and our school's curriculum for excellence has become embedded as the way we do education. Exam passes are at an all-time high. School leaver destinations are the best on record. Of students who left school in 2013, more than 9 out of 10 are in employment, training or education. But despite these improvements, and they are improvements, we need to do more. School leavers from the 20% most disadvantaged areas do only half as well as their equivalents from the most affluent areas. In the most deprived areas, uh, the most deprived 10% of areas, uh, fewer than one young person in every three leaves school with at least one higher. In the most affluent areas, it's four out of every five. And in the Scotland we seek, that gap is quite simply unacceptable. That is why we have made our top priority to raise attainment for all and ensure that all of Scotland's children and young people get an equal chance in our schools. Mm. Education will not fulfil its potential as a societal good until we have closed the attainment gap. Presiding officer, too many children in Scotland have their life chances determined by their postcode rather than their talent. No one in this chamber should accept that waste of potential. It undermines our economy and eats at the very fabric of our society. Education is the best give that we can give to people and of course it is a right. And it should also be a passport to a better place. Mr MacArthur. Ian yeah, MacArthur. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. She, she points to the, the postcode lottery, and I, I think she's right in identifying that certain postcodes there are particular problems with poverty and lower attainment. But I think we would all accept, do we do not, that in almost every postcode there are those uh, for whom the attainment gap is a very uh, real and significant problem, and that the approach, therefore, on an area basis, is going to miss out some of those who live in more affluent areas but who are nevertheless subject to poverty. Secretary. I think Mr MacArthur does raise an important point. There are children who are being held back from reaching their full potential in every school. Um, that is, is true. There are children who need uh, support, uh, who live in more affluent areas or who attend a school in a more affluent area. But nonetheless, I think as we move forward, and I'll speak about it later in terms of the Scottish Attainment Challenge, we do need to invest a more targeted resource to those children uh, most in need. And that is why, uh, as well as having a targeted approach, you also need to have a firm foundation, a firm universal uh, approach uh, also. Presiding officer, Scotland is by no means unique in having an equity gap and teachers all around the world uh, struggle with how to make up for social disadvantage in their classrooms. Uh, but deprivation isn't destiny. We know from the OECD that there are education systems where disadvantaged students succeed and equity and excellence are not mutually exclusive and you can have one with the other. Central to raising attainment are talented teachers and school leaders, uh, and that's why we have made a commitment in our budget to make available uh, £51 million to maintain teacher numbers uh, across Scotland. Across Scotland, we are blessed with great schools and the most talented, inspiring teachers available anywhere. 
Day on day, they are having a transformational effect on the lives of children and young people in their care. And we want to make sure that that, that excellence is shared and spread. So as part of our programme for government, uh, we will make sure that every local authority uh, has access to an attainment advisor. With the powers that we have, we are doing all that we can to limit the impacts of poverty, particularly on our children and young people. And I will always argue for more powers, uh, but I do accept the need to find ways to do more with what we have. And that's why we are focusing on the early years where the impacts of poverty can be at their worst. Uh, we are taking the lead in pioneering work on early years and on preventative spend. And our early years collaborative, the family nurse partnership and the quality early learning and childcare are making a real difference to life chances. And this government is already delivering 16 hours a week uh, of free childcare for all three and four year olds. And from last October, that entitlement was extended to 15% of two year olds and will be further extended to 27% of two year olds uh, from August this year. And that is more hours of early learning and childcare than any other part uh, of the UK. And of course, we've set out an ambitious plan uh, to increase childcare provision uh, even further. So building on the solid foundation of early years, we will focus relentlessly on driving up attainment in our schools. And last year we launched the Raising Attainment for All programme. And that is already involved in more than 150 schools and taking a very forensic focus uh, on closing the attainment gap. But we do need to pick up the pace. In the last two months, uh, we have launched three initiatives uh, that will help us do just that. The new literacy and numeracy campaign for primaries 1 to 3, uh, read, write, count, will benefit all children in primary 1 to 3, but with a specific focus on schools and parents uh, in our most disadvantaged communities. And it will provide support to make sure gaps in learning uh, do not develop or increase over time. And we have launched free school meals for children in primary 1 to 3. And this is now benefiting around 135,000 children, the length and breadth of the country. And it's saving families £330 a year. And it is providing the healthy and nutritious lunches uh, that support our children's learning. Of course. Well, Smith, uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. And I uh, thank her also for uh, the measures that she's just outlined, which undoubtedly will be helpful. Given that the statistics to which she referred in the opening part of her speech have been part of the educational scene for a very long time, could the Scottish Government tell us what it is the catalyst that has made you want to change now? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think that's a tad disingenuous uh, from Ms Smith. I mean, she will be well aware um, of the actions that we've taken uh, over uh, the piece over the long term. I've already mentioned the Raising Attainment for All programme. Uh, there is also the Skills Improvement programme for Scotland. And like the Raising Attainment for All programme, uh, that is about schools working together, uh, sharing knowledge and practice, um, you know, sharing uh, the research. And we know from uh, research that collaboration across the school network is very important. There are other measures, uh, you know, such as the access to education fund. I would contend that teacher numbers uh, is, you know, very uh, positive uh, action in terms of investing uh, in our children's uh, education. And of course, the point that I made uh, to Mr. MacArthur, as well as having these very bespoke uh, initiatives that we are building on a very strong universal offer, uh, whether that's in terms of curriculum for excellence, the work we're doing in early years at uh, GERFECT attainment advisors. So there's a wealth of work that we have been doing over the piece. Uh, and of course, we know that uh, the equity gap in attainment is not uh, an issue uh, that belongs to Scotland uh, alone. But nonetheless, we're absolutely determined uh, to pick up the pace. And of course, last week, the First Minister launched a new Scottish uh, attainment challenge. And this has been backed by a fund of £100 million uh, over four years, with £20 million uh, committed for the, the coming year. And to start with, uh, we will be targeting uh, those local authorities with the highest concentration of pupils uh, living in deprived areas. And I am pleased to inform the Chamber that initially the fund will be concentrated on Glasgow, Dundee, Inverclyde, Western Bartonshire, North Ayrshire, Clackmannanshire and North Lanarkshire Council areas. 
And we know that many of these authorities are already doing well, but we are confident that with further support that they can do more. However, I fully recognise that there is a need across Scotland during the coming year. Uh, we will continue to work with other uh, local authority areas such as East Ayrshire and Fife, which are geographically diverse, socially mixed, uh, but where there are real pockets uh, of severe deprivation. And we will work uh, with local authorities to dig deeper into addressing that local need. The attainment fund will be directed specifically to improve literacy, numeracy, health and wellbeing in primary schools. Um, if we can close the attainment gap when children are young, the benefits will continue into secondary schools uh, and beyond. And there will be a, a bespoke improvement plan and access to resources and expertise uh, in each area. And we will measure improvement rigorously and ensure that lessons are learned nationally uh, about what works and, of course, about what doesn't work. And I have asked Education Scotland, as part of its review of inspections, to consider with partners how we can measure outcomes for disadvantaged pupils. And this will be part of a wider piece of work with key partners to establish a national improvement framework, uh, providing a resource for teachers and allowing us to gauge progress uh, across the country. Presiding officer, we know from the evidence that some of our looked after children face particular disadvantages. We know that those children and young people who are looked after at home it, have the poorest educational outcomes of all. And we also know that mentoring, especially long-term mentoring, can make a significant difference to this group of young people. So that's why, in addition to the £10 million investment to support the implementation of the Children and Young Person Act, I am pleased to confirm that the Scottish Government's commitment today to ensuring that all looked after children and young people are offered the support uh, of a mentoring relationship with a trusted adult who will remain alongside them for as long as that young person chooses. Uh, of course. John Lamont. Through the first uh, Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the particular concerns of kinship carers, not just about financial matters, but access to educational psychologists and support that a child who is actually in a care home would get. Um, I wonder if you would like to comment on the progress you've made in ensuring that those kind of services for kinship care children are being made available. Cabinet Secretary. I think it's a fair point to make that in terms of increasing the attainment of children, and particularly children who have more disadvantages, that we need to also look beyond the classroom and into their home environment. And there is a very important piece of work being taken forward previously by Eileen Campbell and now Fiona McLeod to find a resolution to some of the issues faced by kinship carers in particular. And I'm happy to update Ms Lamont of that separately. But a very important point that I wanted to make specifically about mentoring and looked after young people is that we will be actively taking forward a key recommendation of the LACSEC Mentoring Hub uh, to establish a national mentoring scheme for children aged between 8 and 14 years old who are looked after at home. And funding was allocated uh, to the education portfolio as part of the autumn budget statement. And I can today announce that funding of half a million pounds uh, from this year's first year uh, will go into that scheme. And the Minister for Children and Young People will announce further details of the scheme in due course. Presiding officer, in our whole approach, we will continue to be led by the lessons from the very best of practice elsewhere. We must continue to look at what is happening internationally and, yes, to other parts of the UK. And our attainment challenge it will learn from the London challenge, but we'll not adapt uh, it wholesale. We will adapt the learning to a Scottish context and not just import the model. And we are also learning from Ontario's Special Secretariat for Literacy and Numeracy, which has had a big uh, impact also. Scottish education has always looked to the world eh, and so too have others looked to what Scotland is doing. And in the past 12 months, Scotland has received over 20 overseas delegations from countries eh, such as Australia, India, China, Norway, Finland and Holland. And next year, Scotland is hosting the International Congress eh, for School Effectiveness and Improvement. And the President of which, who has praised Scotland for continuously proving to be a showcase for better education for all. And that 
exchange of ideas is the very fabric of our education system. It is indeed how we do things and taking the very best practice from elsewhere and adapting it to our circumstances and our context. And that is why, that is what is uniquely uh, Scottish, uh, a uniquely Scottish approach to education. Presiding officer, we know that prosperity and fairness must always go hand in hand. Uh, I believe there is nowhere else in the UK or indeed Europe that is prioritising educational attainment as we are. Uh, our recent steps are providing a fresh impetus uh, in closing the attainment gap. And in our education system, we have a strong record of progress. We have all the elements in place, a unique curriculum fit for the future, and schools that are eager for success and a system that is supporting them. And I am confident that our schools and our workforce uh, can deliver uh, on the attainment programme, and I'm delighted to move the motion in my name. Thank you. I now call on Ian Gray to speak to a move amendment number 12316.2. Mr Gray, about 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, President Officer. We, uh, on this side of the Chamber, welcome this debate, and uh, today uh, that is much more than the usual opening platitude. Uh, it is eight years since this SNP Government came to power, and long past time they should have woken up to the need to act on the achievement gap. In fairness, the First Minister flagged it up as an issue she cared about when she was elected leader by her party, but it has still taken, what, about three months or so before the Government has brought any action forward to this Parliament. Still, more joy shall be in heaven over one sinner which repenteth, as the uh, previous First Minister used to like to misquote. And all this matters so much, exactly for the reason the Cabinet Secretary outlined, that if there is any investment we can make in our future, collectively and as individuals, it is in education. If there is a path to the chance of a better life, it lies through education. If there is a silver bullet to slay the spectre of poverty, it is education. George Washington Carver called education the key to unlock the golden door to freedom, and he should know, given his journey from slavery to scientist. And indeed, educational equality is an idea woven through the very history of this nation. From the Book of Discipline in 1561 to the School Establishment Acts of 1616 and 1633 passed by our predecessor Parliament, the Acts which created and implemented the idea of a school in every parish. So we like to tell ourselves that we gave universal education to the world and that we have the best schools uh, anywhere. Sometimes then we are too complacent. The OECD report of 2007, this one, should have set alarm bells ringing then. It praised the strengths of Scottish schools, but then it said children from poorer communities are more likely than others to underachieve. The gap associated with poverty and deprivation in local authority areas appears to be very wide. So this is the not-so-secret shame of Scotland schools, that who you are and how much your parents earn will define your educational attainment and your life chances more than anything else. The Cabinet Secretary herself pointed out that school leavers from the most deprived 20% of areas currently do only half as well as school leavers from the least deprived areas. And in truth, this has not been improving. Indeed, our PISA results show a decline in our relative international standing and no real change in the attainment gap. The number of young people not in education, employment or training remains stubbornly high at around 30,000. And the Scottish Government's own survey showed numerous levels falling at every level. And this year we will see uh, the results on literacy. This will not improve until we do something specific about it. We cannot close the attainment gap by raising attainment for all. And that is why the government's attainment fund is very welcome indeed. The trick now, of course, is to spend it in ways which make a real difference. It cannot be spread too thinly or it will not work. It has to be significantly targeted, and especially at primary and pre-primary intervention, 
because we know this pernicious gap in achievement is already significant at the age of five. It does have to include a major focus on literacy and numeracy. It has to support the families of children at the wrong end of this attainment gap, because school is not the only answer. And it also has to raise the quality of teaching and leadership in those schools, exactly where the barriers pupils face are the greatest. It has to provide particular support for looked after children. And so the announcement today has much of this, and that is to be welcomed. And we are certainly willing to give the Attainment Fund a fair wind. But we simply believe that we need to do yet more and that we can. And that is why we have proposed that when this Parliament gains powers over income tax, we choose explicitly to tax higher earners by reintroducing a 50p tax rate and we direct some of this to redouble our efforts to end the stain of inequity on our society. Our proposal is £25 million every year, £125 million in the course of the next Parliament, devoted to attacking this attainment gap at its very sharpest, focused on those schools, around 20 perhaps, at the very front line. High schools, yes, but more importantly, their associated primaries. And all this on top of the four-year attainment fund. And if we look for these schools, we will find that some of them will not be covered in the local authorities that the Cabinet Secretary has announced today. In this city, for example, two or three schools who need this kind of support because they are at the very sharp end of this gap. And let me be clear, I taught in schools like these. They are not failing. Many of them are overperforming, delivering improvements to young people's life chances above and beyond anything we might reasonably expect. As an ex-teacher, I know that these are the schools you look to first to see the best, most innovative, most inspiring teaching and teachers. But the barriers faced by young people in these schools are so great that they need more additional support to overcome them. Their families need more support too, and those who teach them need more support as well. That is why we propose in these schools doubling classroom assistance in the primary schools, freeing up teacher time that way, introducing specialist literacy and numeracy teachers in these schools for parents as well as for pupils. This is why we wish to see a new charter teacher scheme introduced to reward those who devote their skills, experience and career to changing lives in the classrooms at the very sharpest end of the attainment gap. And the truth is, that we will not resolve this in the four years of any attainment fund. We need an ongoing, guaranteed and relentless effort. And we won't succeed if we don't target pretty ruthlessly, at least for part of our efforts. But our proposals don't contradict the Scottish Government's ideas. They complement them and double the resources for them from a different and new source of funding to which we will have access soon. Frankly, there are some basics that the Scottish Government also need to get right. This problem is not helped by the loss of over 4,000 teachers from our schools since 2007. It is not helped by schools closing and subjects disappearing because of teacher shortages. It is not helped by the disappearance of 140,000 students from our colleges or the ending of successful schemes like the schools of ambition for no good reason at all. The Cabinet Secretary needs to get these sorted. And she could start by telling the SQA to drop their ridiculous charging scheme for exam reviews, which is discriminating in favour of private school pupils against state school pupils and in favour of those with engaged parents against those who don't have them. It is just one more barrier in the attainment gap and she could fix it today. But the big thing she can do, I'm really short of time, but the big thing that the Cabinet Secretary can do today is to seize what is a golden opportunity. Match our support for the Scottish Government's attainment fund 
with her support for our proposals to go further. Let's double the resources to which we commit ourselves, and not for four years, but for as long as it takes. Let's make this our national purpose in education, that your success, your life chances, will depend on your ability and your hard work, not on where you were born or what your parents earn. Let us put every hand on Carver's golden key to freedom, because that was the unique far-sighted educational vision Scotland gave to the world. A school in every parish, every child with the power and freedom to read the Bible and any other book they wanted for themselves. A country which could produce a ploughman who yet read Greek and Latin and penned poetry which entrances the world to this very day. It is to that purpose and that end that I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. I now call on Mary Scanlon to speak to and move Amendment 12316.1. Six minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, we are also pleased to be having another debate on attainment following the Scottish Government debate on this issue in October. And uh, Scottish Conservative uh, debate, sorry. Um, uh, and it will surprise no one that we don't support the 50 pence uh, tax rate moved by Labour. I move the amendment in my name, which affirms our willingness to work together with all parties on this issue, better support for pupils uh, and those with additional support needs, the need for more science teachers and the need to address the uptake in science, technology, engineering, maths and, of course, much more. And uh, like uh, Ian Gray, I was also a teacher, a teacher, an economics lecturer in further and higher education for 20 years before coming here. And I know well how many pupils failed at school, failed badly at school and absolutely flourished uh, with uh, a second chance in further and higher education. I want to see them getting that best chance at school rather than when they're 30, 40 and 50. Uh, we would also welcome the additional funding uh, and the additional measure uh, to focus on attainment, but this must be accompanied by the need for robust data, a rigorous strategy and targeted spending to achieve the desired outcomes and a more focused approach. I think Liam MacArthur alluded to that. It was interesting to see that the Scottish Government uh, had to go to London to get advice on attainment, when in fact very similar advice and recommendations are available much closer to home. Uh, both the Audit Scotland report on school education in June last year and Professor Sue Ellis from the Centre of Education and Social Policy at Strathclyde University, along with the London Challenge, all focus on the need for data and data literacy, the need for a culture of accountability, improved leadership and better professional development and more. I have to say the unsightly rammy between the Scottish Government and COSLA will benefit no child in Scotland. And if I could just take Murray Council. Murray have done their level best to recruit supply and permanent teachers. They have a higher rate for supply teachers. They are working with private housing providers for uh, excellent accommodation for new teachers coming. And yet, there are 11 experienced teachers who are spouses of RAF personnel at Lossiemouth, but they cannot get through the bureaucracy of the General Teaching Council for Scotland. These are teachers in primary and secondary schools who are perfectly capable of teaching in England, but according to the GTC, not fit to teach in Scotland. So more could be done to help Murray Council. And Murray will not get any of the additional funding uh, from the Scottish Government, despite doing their best. John Scott, Deputy Presiding Officer, raised some excellent points on South Ayrshire. Again, a council that have maintained their teacher ratio below 13.2% since 2001. It is unlikely that South Ayrshire, although they've kept to the letter and the spirit of the national agreement, uh, it is unlikely that they will get any of the uh, government additional funding also. 
And neither, as John Scott said, does the Council, the Government, recognise falling school roles. South Ayrshire could have a surplus of 10 to 15 teachers with no job at a cost to council taxpayers of half a million pounds, so they are actually being penalised for doing everything right over the years. And then let's look at where we are just now, uh, not just now, uh, from the Audit Scotland report, and I quote, and this is why I'm concerned about the 100 million funding, will it do what we want it to do? And I quote, there has been no independent evaluation of how much councils spend on education and what this delivers in terms of improved attainment and wider achievement of pupils. So how can we, although welcoming this money, how can we be sure that the 100 million plus will make any difference? Yeah. And Sue Ellis, uh, according to uh, Strathclyde University, the GTC could also review whether sufficient weight is given to literacy teaching in teacher training. I also find it incredible, unbelievable, that Scotland currently offers no national literacy tests for primary and early secondary pupils. And two thirds of our councils buy expensive tests that offer little support to help schools and teachers to understand, interpret, and interrogate or use these results. It's quite incredible. And again, from Strathclyde University, uh, asking that schools, we should be encouraging schools to create positive cultures for data use and provide free national available tests, standardised where appropriate for literacy development. So my worry is that 100 million could be assumed as a measure of success. We've thrown a million, 100 million at it, but unless we actually measure what works, this is not going to uh, have the outcome we assume. And can I also, in my five seconds left, uh, also in the Audit Scotland report, uh, the councils with the highest please. spending on teacher and teacher numbers, the three highest ones in urban areas are Labour. And yet we've had this unsightly rammy yeah. that Labour are reducing teachers. And in fact, the lowest in urban and rural Scotland is an SNP controlled council. So can we perhaps leave the uh, politics aside and concentrate on the children? And my final point, deciding no, officer, we all need to ensure that teaching is a, I know the SNP don't like no, to hear, I'm hear you'll about have to it. Stop. But teaching should be a career of choice where teachers are valued for their contribution Thank and you. not shouted down by the SNP, as we've heard today. And the presiding officer, sadly. Um, thank you very much. Um, we now move to open debate, and I call on George Adam to be followed by Cara Hilton. Six minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I too welcome this debate. For me, it's one of the most important issues that we must address. For too long, it's been the case that people from certain backgrounds do not have the same level of educational attainment than others. Over the years, there have been many reasons for this, but it's welcomed the First Minister's remark that a child born today in one of our deprived communities will, by the time he or she leaves school, have the same chance of going to university as a child born in our more affluent communities. Surely this is something we can all agree on, presiding officer. This is an investment in the future of Scotland's children and one that can provide a better future for many of our young people. The Scottish Government has achieved much during its time in government, but we must recognise that attainment is an important area that we must all seek to improve. The First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary mentioned in their speech as well announced that the Scottish Attainment Challenge at school leavers from our most deprived 20% of areas currently do only half as well as school leavers from wealthier areas. And I agree with Nicola Sturgeon when she said too many children still have their life chances influenced by where they live than by how talented they are or how hard they work. This can be seen in my own constituency where there is an east-west divide, a position where one end of Paisley is the wealthier area and the other part of the area is one of the most deprived areas in Scotland and dealing with the many challenges uh, that this entails. But we must continue to strive to ensure that our children do not become a societal victim because of the community they are a part of. 
The Education Committee found during the post-16 reform bill that University of the West of Scotland is one of the only universities who have managed to uh, ensure that 20% of their pupils come from the lowest wage backgrounds in studying at their institution. This is excellent, but it also gives them many ongoing challenges. Uh, it ensures that young people may still need to deal with the difficulties that other students do not have. It may be not in year one that they have the difficulty, it may be in year two or three that may lead to a situation where a young person drops out. But UWS are working with other educational institutions and attainment in the west of Scotland on Focus West. Focus West works in 37 secondary schools located in 11 local authority areas, all of which have progression rate higher of 22% or less. Presiding officer, the West of Scotland is home to 41% of Scotland's population and has nearly 70% of Scotland's most deprived areas. Since the inception of Focus West in 2008, they have worked with nearly 22,000 pupils and has contributed to an average increase in progression to higher education across its core schools. So, presiding officer, there is much good work going across our nation, but we must aspire to do much more. That is why I welcome the Scottish Government's new Scottish Attainment uh, Challenge that will be backed by an Attainment Scotland fund of more than £100 million over a four-year period to help pupils from our most disadvantaged communities. The Scottish Attainment Challenge, which will draw on the experience of the London Challenge, as has been mentioned earlier, will be help transform school performance in, in the City of London and other international experiences will be taken on board. And incidentally, presiding officer, I recently attended UCU's National Conference in London and it was heartening to hear so many English-based educationalists using Scotland as a beacon of hope and a way forward for education in the rest of the UK because of the key Scottish Government policies like free education, Curriculum for Excellence, Getting It Right for Every Child, Early Years Framework and Opportunities for All. They used all of them as examples of best practice and the way forward. But we are all aware of the cost of education from Westminster for the rest of the UK. Research from Spice recently found that since fees rose to £9,000 three years ago, they have cost students in the rest of the United Kingdom £14 billion. £14 billion and currently Scottish students studying at Scottish University saved £1 billion over the same number of years. Not only that, but the ongoing austerity plans of Westminster are causing despair throughout Scotland and the rest of the UK. While the Scottish Government are making progress in reducing the attainment gap, they can only go so far in mitigating the damage caused by Westminster policies. An additional 100,000 of Scotland's children will be living in poverty by 2020 because of UK welfare reforms. And this is before the next round of cuts due in 2017 and 18. It is unacceptable, presiding officer, that due to the decisions of the UK government, children and families in Scotland are suffering. Even with the ongoing problems created by Westminster, the Scottish Government is challenging itself to achieve better attainment levels. The fund will be targeted initially at schools with the biggest concentration of households in deprived areas, targeting areas with additional teachers, materials for classrooms, resource develop new out-of-school activities. It will focus on improving literacy, numeracy, health and wellbeing in primary schools with clear objectives to give all primary school age pupils, regardless of background, the best possible start in life. All parts of Scotland will need to not need the same uniformed ideas, and this is addressed uh, with the bespoke improvement plan. It's important being appropriate to local circumstances and will be agreed for each school or cluster of schools. This will include an agreement to gather in a proportionate way the data that will be required to measure the impact of the interventions supported, ensuring that we are reaching the right people at the right time. This year's initial funding of £20 million was announced by the Deputy First Minister during the budget. We already know that there are many great things happening in our schools, but by providing greater access to funding, expertise and resource, schools will have more opportunity to offer the creative and innovative teaching that helps all our young people succeed. In closing, presiding officer, I would like to say it was interesting to read Save the Children said about the fund. We welcome the Most £100 million pound commitment to the Scottish Attainment Fund over the first £20 million pound tranche in 2015-16. The focus on the poorest children within these new commitments is particularly important. For me, presiding officer, that is the most important part of this issue, and surely that is something we can all agree on. Thank you very much. Now I call on Cara Hilton to be followed by Stuart Maxwell.
Thanks, President Officer. And I welcome the opportunity to take part in today's debate about educational attainment and the recognition across the political divide that we need to work to tackle education inequality that continues to undermine the life chances of thousands of children and young people in Scotland. Addressing the attainment gap in our schools is a top priority for the Scottish Labour Party, and I know it's certainly a priority for my constituents in Dunfermline. It may have taken eight years, but I'm pleased that these plans are now on the table and that this is right at the top of the political agenda where it belongs. Because closing the gap has got to be the number one education priority, and not just for the next 15 months until the 2016 elections, but for the next Scottish Government too. It should anger us all that in 21st century Scotland, family income continues to have more influence over children's learning and outcomes than children's talents or skills. Thousands of our children right across Scotland uh, caught up in a cycle of disadvantage from which there's little prospect of escape and which carries on throughout life. Education should be about opening up your opportunities and ensuring that every single child reaches their potential. But we all know that no child will ever reach their full potential when they turn up at school hungry, when they're living in damp, overcrowded accommodation or when they've got a chaotic family life. According to Save the Children, children living in poverty are twice as likely as other children to start school already behind in their learning and development. One in five children living in poverty are leaving primary school not reading well. One in two are underperforming in writing in the early secondary years. Save the Children have found that the attainment gap between the richest and the poorest young people when they leave school is equivalent to around three A grades at higher level, which is pretty staggering. Inequalities in education have got a direct influence on future incomes too, with more than one in five school leavers from deprived areas going straight into unemployment, double the national average. So we need decisive and radical action if we're going to break the cycle. The new Attainment Scotland Fund and the Attainment Challenge is a welcome step forward, and as this so is the focus on the poorest children, although it's disappointing that there's no money being announced for Fife. It's absolutely vital that we focus on supporting children based on what we know is works. And so I welcome to the recognition that we need to learn from success elsewhere, such as the London Challenge Fund which programme, which was delivered by Labour when we were in government. But we want to go further too, and that's why Labour's amendment today um, highlights our proposal to use additional revenues from a new 50 pence tax rate for the better off to invest a further £25 million every year into tackling the attainment gap in our schools even further, targeting even more support where it's needed most, investing in even more teaching assistance and a literacy project to support both pupils and parents, and including special literacy support programmes for looked after children. The attainment debate must never be viewed in isolation, so I recognise the rec I'm pleased to see the recognition across the Chamber that plans to close the gap must go hand in hand with plans to tackle poverty and to support families. And I'd like to see more initiatives like family centres developed in our most deprived background areas, because we can't ignore the fact that when, while the education system does work well for many children, for children from the poorest backgrounds, it simply doesn't work well enough, and poverty continues to be a barrier in accessing the widest opportunities in learning and in life. Not having enough money makes it harder for mums and dads to provide the experiences that children need to flourish both in and out of school, and constantly struggling can make parenting difficult and, and stressful. And the reality is, we can only change this if we have a radical solution that addresses the persistent poverty and inequality that too many children in Scotland and across the UK are brought up with. Breaking the link between poverty and attainment is key, and this has got to be the driver behind our policies. In Fife, which has got the third highest number of children living in poverty in Scotland, the Labour-led Council has embraced a radical approach to closing the gap, which is based on early and targeted intervention to support the children and families most in need and break the cycle of disadvantage. Intervening early to secure attachment between children and their parents through embracing a family nurture approach that meets the needs of children and families from pre-birth to preschool and onwards into the classroom and beyond by providing extensive parenting support programmes and working especially with new mums and dads to build their confidence, their self-esteem and their skills. Ensuring that families have got extra support and know where to turn to, that they can access intervention in a non-stigmatised way, getting as little or as much support as they need, such as help with drug and alcohol issues. An approach that's based on developing nurture schools that are as inclusive as possible for all children, with teachers, early years workers, psychologists, social workers, health workers, all agencies working together to ensure that every child is supported at all stages of their education. Focusing not just on literacy and numeracy, 
but in, uh, in the school, but what happens beyond the school gate and the home learning environment and in all aspects of well-being. Fife has also embraced the Workshop for Literacy approach and I have visited a number of schools in my constituency to see it work in practice. Uh, the approach uses high-quality high storybooks, which are not only read to children, but used as a theme for learning, with reading, writing, listening, drawing, drama and talking activities based around each story. And these really do capture the imagination of every single child and bring learning to life. It is amazing how many learning opportunities can evolve from one, uh, from one single book, and this approach really is des delivering results in classrooms. One of the most important ways that we can address educational inequality is by ensuring that every single child is reading well. And I welcome the, um, the statement from Angela Constance that this is going to be a top priority. I'd like to commend here to the Read On Get On initiative, which is aimed at ensuring that every child in Scotland is reading well by age 11. And I hope this is a campaign we can all get behind too. Um, presiding officer, all children have the right to the best education. It is simply unacceptable that some children are born into a life of disadvantage from which it is difficult to escape. It is time to break the cycle, and this is only going to happen if resources are prioritised and targeted, if we reach out to the children who are currently left behind and ensure they catch up before they leave primary school. Scotland will only be you the best, close, best place please. to grow up when every single child has the support they need to be the best they can be and when no child is left behind. I am pleased that across the Chamber we unite in their aspirations to close the gap, and I hope we can work together to make this happen. Thank you very much. Now, Colin Stewart Maxwell to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Ensuring that all of Scotland's children reach their educational potential is an ambition which I'm sure is shared by everyone in the Chamber. It's an issue of fundamental importance to pupils and parents across the country. As convener of the Education and Culture Committee, I want to inform members of some of the work the committee has been undertaking on educational attainment. We are committing a significant part of our work programme this year to examining the progress being made in reducing the attainment gap in Scotland. The Committee's inquiry on attainment will begin by holding a series of evidence sessions to explore specific issues around attainment in more depth. Firstly, we will examine the Wood Report and the implications for schools, teachers and pupils of the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce. This will be followed by an evidence session examining how parents and guardians can work with schools to raise all people's attainment, especially those whose attainment is lowest. Finally, the committee will gather evidence on the role of the third sector and the private sector in removing barriers to educational attainment. The committee's focus on attainment builds on our previous work examining the attainment of Scotland's looked-after children. Improving the life chances of Scotland's most vulnerable children must continue to be a key focus of this Parliament. In April, the Children and Young People Act will come into effect, and I certainly hope it will help to deliver the best possible start in life for children in Scotland. Members, yes. That the, the bill you mentioned is now an act. The financial review for kinship carers has not yet been completed, and they are a particular group that need to be supported because there is obviously prevalence of low attainment for that group is one that I think is shared across the, the chamber. Do you believe that you need to do something about this financial review? Of course, I, I mean I, 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 where I agree with um, uh, Ms. Lamont is that of course we share that particular um, uh, ideal to make sure that kinship carers get the best out outcome possible. It was the SNP when we came into government in 2007, who first turned the proper attention of Parliament to that issue. And, and I, I noticed that the Cabinet Secretary mentioned the work uh, that is ongoing on this very fact by the Minister uh, who is sitting next to the Cabinet Secretary. So clearly, uh, if Infuel MacLeod uh, publishes that work, I am sure that uh, the member will be very interested in that. Now, members have engaged constructively with the Committee's work in this area, and I am delighted by that. And I hope that this will continue to be in the case as we gather evidence to inform our examination of educational attainment. And at this point, can I very much welcome the announcement on mentoring for looked after children at home, particularly given the work of the Educa Education Committee and its earlier report on this very issue. However, I think it is worth highlighting that there is plenty to applaud in Scotland's education system. National exam results are at an all-time high, and we continue to benefit from a world-class high ed higher education sector. School leaver destinations are also the best on record, with 90 per cent of school leavers going into work, training or education. But of course, we must never stop striving for better. The difference in educational attainment for children from deprived backgrounds compared to children from better off families is not acceptable, and we must do all we can to address it. Therefore, I am greatly encouraged by the First Minister's determination to build on the progress that we have made so far and to do more to raise attainment for Scotland's most disadvantaged children. I very much welcome the new £100 million Attainment Scotland Fund, which over the next few years will go a long way to giving children from Scotland's most disadvantaged communities the support they need to fill their potential. 
Last year's report by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation highlighted some of the challenges Scotland faces in closing the attainment gap. And it's not new, it's been going on for decades. The report suggested that just 28% of children from poorer backgrounds perform well in numeracy, compared to 56% of those from better off backgrounds. Children from deprived households are also more likely to leave school earlier and with poorer qualifications. Research also suggests that parental involvement programmes can have a significant impact on attainment, with the 2011 Growing Up in Scotland study concluding that improving parent-child learning opportunities in the home may be beneficial. The Education and Culture Committee is currently running an online survey to gather the views of parents about how schools work with them to support their children's learning. It is aimed at people who currently have children in school, and I would urge members to encourage their constituents to submit their views to the survey before it closes on the 7th of March. Another significant finding from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation paper is the importance of closing the attainment gap in literacy. Reading is particularly beneficial for enhancing vocabulary and supporting achievement in other areas. The 2009 PISA survey shows that increasing reading engagement has the potential to reduce approximately 30% of the attainment gap associated with poverty. I therefore again very much welcome the First Minister's announcement that a new literacy and numeracy campaign will be launched for children in Primary 1 to Primary 3. The Read Write Count initiative will ensure that every child will have access to a library of books and deliver locally run sessions to support parents to better link education at school and in the home. Studies illustrate that the link between poverty and poor literacy attainment can be challenged and it can be changed. Dr Sue Ellis of Strathclyde University, who others have already mentioned, one of the authors of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation report on attainment, has said that an important issue is how well we equip our teachers with the knowledge of how to teach literacy. In 2013, I wrote to universities across Scotland to ask about the number of contact hours allocated to literacy teaching in Scottish primary initial teacher education courses. I have to say I was somewhat disappointed. The response revealed significant variation, with some courses allocating just 20 hours in a four-year degree and others allocating four times as much. And I would very much be grateful if the Minister would comment on what can be done to ensure that teacher training courses adequately equip teachers with the necessary knowledge to teach literacy to as high a standard as possible. Presiding officer, I'd like to conclude by looking briefly at how poverty impacts on educational attainment. Evidence from the OECD suggests that in Scotland, the socio-economic background of a child's parents has a greater influence on educational outcomes than the school attended. Social and economic inequalities mean that some parents struggle to provide a supportive learning environment for their children at home. In Scotland, one in five children grow up in the poverty and the reality is that decisions at Westminster on welfare and social policy make addressing the attainment gap even more challenging. I share the First Minister's view that a good education is the greatest gift we can give Scotland's young people. Therefore, there is no doubt that a quality education offers the best route for young people to escape the poverty trap. Many thanks. Now call on Liam MacArthur to be followed by Chick Brodie. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Officer. I too welcome today's debate. It provides a further opportunity to reflect, I think, on where progress has been made over the lifetime of this Parliament under successive administrations, but also, and more importantly, to recognise the scale of the task that I think we all accept uh, still lies ahead of us. The investment of the £20 million over the coming year to support efforts to improve educational outcomes for children in Scotland's most deprived communities is most certainly welcome promise of funding thereafter is also one that I know that those active in the field welcome too. An attainment fund of £100 million, of course, is a suspiciously round figure. Uh, it bears all the telltale hallmarks of an initiative aimed at catching the eye ahead of an election, uh, but that in of itself is no reason to diminish the welcome it receives. Where we need to be careful, however, is ensuring that we don't lose sight of what it is we should be seeking to achieve and some of the difficult and complex choices that are inherent in that. In that regard, it may be best to avoid a Dutch auction about whose attainment fund is greater if we all accept that it is unlikely that, it, unlikely that we will ever have enough money to do everything that we would wish to do. It then becomes a question of how best to target the resources we have to make the greatest impact where there is greatest need. It is that aspect of this, the debate, presiding officer, that I wish to focus on for the remainder of my remarks. First, let me echo some of what others have said about the problem that we face, the disparity between the outcomes, both educational but also more widely, of those from disadvantaged backgrounds and their uh, more affluent peers is marked. This inequality scars lives by preventing the potential of each and every individual 
being realised. It is also a drag on our economy and invariably a cost to society. Save the Children make clear that the foundations for the attainment gap are established in the earliest years, often even before a child is born. The longer this goes unchecked, the more deeply entrenched the disparities become and the more difficult and costly it is to turn the situation around. That is why Scottish Liberal Democrats have placed such a high priority on targeting resources on the early years and on those most in need. It is an approach reflected in our consistent argument for, uh, in favour of extending free early learning and childcare to two-year-olds from the poorest backgrounds. While ministers initially were content to focus on universal provision for three and four-year-olds, ultimately, thankfully, they accepted the case made by my party and a range of children's charities that additional targeted support was needed before the age of three. And they were right to do so. All the evidence shows that educational investment before the age of three delivers the greatest return. For every pound spent before a child is three, 11 pounds is saved later in life. As well as helping closing the attainment gap, therefore, there's an opportunity to invest in the economy and the social well-being of our country. So I applaud last year's decision by ministers that accept the case for expanding the provision. But the fact remains that whereas 40% of two-year-olds from the most disadvantaged backgrounds south of the borders now receive this support, the equivalent figure in Scotland is still short of 30%. I urge the Cabinet Secretary and our colleagues, therefore, to go further to match the levels delivered by the Coalition Government and the rest of the UK. This would give a further 8,000 two-year-olds in Scotland the opportunity they need to get on in life. Having accepted the principle of the argument, it's time for Scottish Ministers, I think, to show greater ambition to make a real difference in tackling the attainment gap. Turning to the proposed attainment fund, again, let me stress that I welcome any additional resources. I have no doubt at all that the £20 million can deliver genuine improvements. But if the intention is to focus on areas of poverty rather than individuals in poverty, I fear there's a real risk that many of those in most desperate need stand little chance of receiving it. Last year, Scottish ministers talked of using SIMD20 as the basis for targeting efforts to widen access in higher education. In the end, they had to accept that this ignored the interests of those from poorer households who happen to live in better off areas. Uh, the lessons, it appears, have not been learned. And this situation is made potentially worse by the fact that those who find themselves excluded from the fund through an accident of geography are already likely to face higher costs from living in or adjacent to more affluent areas, a possible double whammy. A more effective way of targeting the resources and reducing the postcode lottery would be to adopt the approach underlying the pupil premium introduced south of the border, where the funding attaches to the pupil rather than to the school or to a neighbourhood. As Save the Children point out, and I quote, targeted initiatives that support pupils living in poverty to catch up quickly if they start school already behind can be hugely effective using a range of measures, including one-to-one -one teaching and parental involvement. I'm running out of time. I'm sorry. It's very sorry. However, acknowledging that poverty is not confined solely to poor neighbourhoods is essential if we are to tackle inequality and close the attainment gap in a way that is fair and equitable. We should also acknowledge, too, as the Cabinet Secretary fairly did, that while there is a link between poverty and attainment, nothing of this is inevitable. Save the Children recently told Parliament that some schools and local authorities are achieving great things for the poorest children in their areas, ensuring that their ability to do well in the classroom is not hindered by growing up in a low-income household. Deputy Presiding Officer, there are many other points I could have raised had I the time, but let me briefly conclude by highlighting one initiative that dovetails well with the Read, Write, Count campaign referred to in the Government's motion. As Cara Hilton uh, said, Save the Children's Read On, Get On initiative aims to ensure that all those entering school this year are confident readers by the time they, uh, they leave primary. My involvement in this campaign has seen me take part in reading sessions in the Hope and Shapensey Primary Schools in my Orkney constituency with others to follow. Uh, and can I just say that uh, Mr Gum and the Dancing Bear and Green Eggs and Ham make a pleasant change from trawling through my papers for the Education Committee, as I'm sure the convener will emphasise. Mr Officer, we can be proud of much of what our schools achieve, but as Stuart Maxwell and Ian Gray uh, were right in pointing out, the evidence shows that our record in closing the attainment gap remains poor. Success in future will depend on our willingness to learn from what has worked, wherever that may be, and to ruthlessly focus on targeting resources where they are most needed and early as possible. For now, I I welcome this debate and the consensus that obviously exists to tackle this stubborn and complex problem. Thank you. Thank you. Now I call on Chick Brodie to be followed by Joanne Lamont. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. <coughs> Attainment, accomplishment, feat, fulfilment, realisation, ability, capability, competence, 
proficiency, skill and talent. I am aware, presiding officer, that there is not one of us who would disavow that all of these have been features of our uh, pupil development and the basis of our collective aspirations for those pupils over the last, not just a few years, it's been a nation's historical aspiration. But uh, we diminish ourselves, presiding officer, uh, our, uh, and diminish our educationalists, our teachers and our pupils by focusing our debate on issues such as these uh, uh, debates on targets, targets that are there for one moment in time, and whether these targets have been met. Instead of establishing whether there has been a basis for continuous improvement, a betterment of educational outcomes and attainments, and to have that as the basis of a mature discussion uh, on the way forward, rather than have meaningless propositions about numbers that are set uh, as being right at that one moment in time. Debate should be about continuous improvement, which I believe we have achieved, yet except that we still have many challenges uh, to face. That continuous improvement is enshrined in the Raising Attainment for All programme launched uh, last year. It, it talked about improved educational outcomes, not targets, educational outcomes for learners over an agreed period and embracing all of the tenets I mentioned at the start of my speech. So we, I believe, despite the cuts in the overall budgets that we face and the challenges of the economy and demography are making improvement uh, through performance uh, and more young people are gaining work or, further in, or, or are in further education uh, and seeking training opportunities. So there are challenges, uh, some out with our control, but let us not blind ourselves with targets that may change over a limited period of time. Now, I heard uh, Mrs Scanlon mention South Ayrshire Council. I have to say I'm a bit closer uh, to that uh, than perhaps she is. And of course, the proof of the pudding uh, in her aversion regarding her teacher numbers will be whether or not South Ayrshire Council vote to accept the monies offered by the Cabinet Secretary uh, 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 for finance. Uh, I suspect they will vote uh, to accept it. But of course, uh, again, because my, my, the point about over a period of time, that with the growth rate or, or uh, lowering of the, of the growth rate in child population in South Asia, we may have a situation where there are sufficient teachers. That provides us with the opportunity of further improving the outcomes and extending leadership where it should be in the classroom. There has been across the board a, a general improvement in school education, as I said, in recent years. No, I'm sorry, I'm carrying on. Uh, as I said, in recent years, curriculum for excellence is being embraced and outcomes have improved. And that school exam results, for example, uh, uh, being the example of that improvement. Now, I welcome the government's acceptance that more has to be done to address the attainment gap and the establishment of the Scottish Attainment Challenge and the £100 million that we've talked about uh, are there to tackle the, uh, the objectives that have been set. But of course, the biggest challenge is to tackle the link between poverty and underachievement. Uh, and it's quite right that we should seek information to extend our knowledge in that particular area. And I'll come back to that in a minute with a bit further, further afield. I was raised in a prefab in Dundee. And I would never have achieved, and some may uh, say that I haven't achieved anything, but uh, what little I have achieved is due largely to the dedication of my parents and teachers. And yes, we lived in what was at that time poverty, not as bad as some are facing today. And while we continue, all of us, to work uh, and er eradicate the penal inequalities of income in our society, let's, uh, let us evangelise uh, with more parental support and involvement of parents uh, so that we can close that inequality in the attainment gap. We can start by, uh, I suggest, removing the charitable uh, status of public schools as an intent. But let us not imagine our system is perfect and that uh, money or funding is the only solution uh, to deficiencies in the system. It is not. If I look, as I have done, and uh, talk to people with, uh, in schools in Asia, some parts of Asia, for example, and talk to them about attainment, Increased attainment is blessed by many features where, from day one, there is little or no 
inequality, where uh, uh, pupils are encouraged, children are encouraged to become inquirers, developing natural curiosity, inquiring and researching, showing independence in learning. They're encouraged to think critically and creatively, to communicate confident, confidently, to act with integrity and honesty, and so it goes on. But again, they've been a, a buttress uh, against any inequality is the fact that uh, there is no large uh, disparity in the incomes of the parents of these families. So I believe, uh, uh, presiding officer, that these situations and others like them, and we should embrace anything that helps improve uh, the situation. Uh, these uh, are set personal attainments to sit alongside close, their basic curriculum needs. Uh, and in the interest of our deserving teachers and keen pupils, let's recognise together that uh, the factors that hinder the closing of the attainment gap, poverty being the key one, uh, let's work together to overcome these in the interests of the political and economic future of Scotland. Many thanks. And now I call on Joanne Lamont to be followed by Colin Beattie. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I think we all recognise the importance of this debate. And I think it's essential to focus on the purpose of addressing the gap in attainment. First of all, simply an issue of equality and fairness. It offends me as a mother, as someone who taught for 20 years, and as a citizen, that somebody's life chances are inhibited by the time they're three years of age, and that we uh, do not do more to address that. We also understand education's role in achieving potential, overcoming barriers, whether these are physical, financial and emotional, and people should have the opportunity to learn in order for them to address the barriers they face. But we also understand it's critical to the economy to have an educated population, and that every child who does not attain is a wasted talent, a talent that could be used and harnessed um, to create a stronger economy. We have the opportunity through closing the attainment gap also to strengthen the economy and harness that energy. And of course we should care, but caring is not enough. And it's been quoted in this chamber before, the American senator who said, don't tell me how much you care, show me your budget. And in this debate, I believe we need across the chamber to test to destruction our presumptions and assumptions about why such a gap exists and what the solutions are. There is here a recognition of the importance of universal provision and targeted provision, which too often on the SNP benches are, po are posed as opposites to each other, when in fact they are complementary. And I hear the argument about geography against individual. I would simply say that the reality in many schools is where there are many children together who are poor, who are um, in challenged. Even a child who is completely supported at home is working in a system where resources are very much under pressure. But I think there's an important debate to be had about getting that balance right. And of course, we recognise the extra funding and welcome it. But there is a deeper question about what choices we make. All young people in Scotland deserve the best start and the very best quality of universal provision. But we also need to understand and address what acts as blocks in the road? What are the things that deny young people the opportunities to deserve? And we also have to confront whether our spending choices amplify the gap rather than diminish it. And as one simple example, to fund our ambitions in higher, higher education at the expense of further education is to amplify that gap rather than to close it. And in focusing on the educational attainment um, gap, I urge the Cabinet Secretary, yes, of course, ask the right questions, but also please have the courage to respond where the answers take you. Does it mean that we need to talk about increasing taxation, as we have said? Does it mean we need to change our priorities? Or do we need to reflect on the consequence of cuts to local government, which have closed the very projects that have supported young people in the past, supported young people in poverty in order that they can access education? We also know that educational attainment is not just about schools. It is about child care. It is about early years. It is about the provision of libraries. It is about the opportunities for young people to learn outside the school setting. It is about health and well-being. And they were excellent projects run during the time of the social inclusion partnerships that the Cabinet Secretary may want to look at. 
All of these things are important. We should not be overwhelmed um, that, and as a consequence that we end up doing nothing. We should take what steps we can. Now, good educational practice... It was in a, a very interesting speech. Could I ask the member, when she talks about the issue of universality, would she agree that that doesn't necessarily mean uniformity in provision? Absolutely, absolutely, because I think it's really important that education follows the needs of the child and the community. And I'm a great advocate, for example, of Gaelic education. And I think that it, there are examples in different communities where need is different. So we have to find ways of delivering real change. It's not just school, but it is also school. We do recognise that schools are critical. And I would recommend looking again at what Strathclyde did in terms of areas of priority treatment. Indeed, a project like my own in Castle Milk High School, working on these very issues many years ago. We don't always have to reinvent the wheel. There's really good work already happening. But it isn't it is, we recognise how critical schools are in creating the opportunity to address um, the, the needs that young people have in nursery, in primary. And I would make a plea for secondary school education, because that's very often where young people fall off the radar altogether. We have to understand the pressure on schools, not just on teachers, but the support they are given. Classroom assistance, admin support, specialist in learning support and behaviour support, attendance officers. The job I did, which I always describe as the educational equivalent of giving a hub, hug, that supports and allows teachers to focus on learning. But critically also, that support can make a child want to come to school, can help them with the issues that they're facing, whether it's bereavement or problems at home or problems in school. It helps them to settle and learn. And it is my concern these are the very things that go first when budgets are cut. Simple little projects that actually can make a difference. So I would say to the Cabinet Secretary, please look at what is happening to the supports, to classroom assistance, to personal assistance. Are young people denied the opportunity to flourish in mainstream education because these are things that are disappearing? And one last point in conclusion, one last plea. The attainment gap can be closed at the early stage in life, but it can also be addressed through second chance education. I understand why we're focusing on 16 to 19 year olds, but in further education, literacy programmes for adults, part time opportunities to learn to for those distant from education and work, reskilling them, that second chance for an adult allows that adult as a parent to ensure that their children are given a better start. That is a virtuous circle that we should be supporting both funding in early years, but also critically at further education stage to achieve what we all desire, is that those all youngsters achieve their full potential. Thank you very much. Now Colin, Colin Beatty to be followed by Jane Baxter. <laughs> Presiding officer, the evidence we have is clear that attainment levels can provide a route out of poverty and deprivation for many Scots at an early age. And I'm sure the Chamber is in no doubt that education is a key factor in determining where a life can be led to. When our young school leavers do not have the opportunity to progress to an initial positive educational destination, then not only are they being de denied the right to better themselves, but the subsequent knock-on benefit to our communities will never be felt. Most of us here today will have welcomed the First Minister's recent announcement of £100 million of investment into the Scottish Attainment Challenge money that will be used to reduce inequality in educational attainment. Scottish education has been improving in recent years, and in my constituency I have seen the number of school leavers going to positive destination rise by over 7 per cent in Midlothian and almost 8 per cent in East Lothian between 2007 and 2013. But we can't rest on our laurels. Despite these increases, we have work to do to make sure that no one misses out on fulfilling their potential. And statistics consistently show that attainment levels are directly linked to deprivation levels, and a recent report by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation spelt some of these facts out. By age five, the Foundation reported, there are gaps of 10 months in problem-solving development and 13 months in vocabulary between children from high-income households and those from low-income households. And that indicates quite clearly just how early the attainment gap begins. The report goes further. By ages 12 to 14, pupils from better off areas are more than twice as likely to do well in numeracy as those from the most deprived areas. The report also notes that children from poorer areas tend to leave school earlier and that low attainment is strongly linked to poor post-school destinations. 
potentially having a major long-term effect on future educational and job prospects. School leavers with the most deprived backgrounds are only one-third as likely to go into higher education, while in employment terms by the age of 22 to 23, low attainers are three times more likely to be unemployed, twice as likely to be working part-time in low-status jobs, or earning substantially less than high attainers. The difference is even more pronounced for women, with a difference in earnings of £44.94 per week for women compared to £23.45 per week for men. And one of the key points the Joseph Rowntree Foundation reports makes is that the socio-economic background of parents is more influential to children's attainment than their school. The clear implication here is that if we can improve the destinations of pupils through increased attainment levels, we can improve the backgrounds for future pupils and thus break the constant rotation of low attainment. The figures, at least in my constituency, may be improving, but complacency will only enhance and reinforce this vicious cycle. In welcoming the £100 million investment that the Government intends to use to minimise the attainment gap, I note that various reports have examined what can be done with such investment. An audit Scotland's report on school education published last June was clear in its methodology and conclusions. The report examined how effective and efficient local councils were with their resources, as well as how much they spent on education and where that money was spent. And it was noted that the majority of council funding went on staff costs, and the report was careful to point out that councils need to be aware of the risk of increased workload for staff, and we must be vigilant to ensure that teachers have the resources and support they need. Without them, we can never hope to reduce the attainment gap. The report further noted that while levels of deprivation have a large influence on attainment, some schools achieve better results than their levels of deprivation would suggest. That implies that deprivation levels cannot be the sole reason for the gap between the highest and lowest performing schools. Therefore, it is crucial that we apply measures that take place across the board and that all schools can benefit from, and not, as Jim Murphy would like, merely focusing on the worst 20, 20 performing schools. Why should the next 20 schools not benefit, or the 20 beyond that? The Scottish Government's programme, Raising Attainment for All, launched last spring, has seen a raft of measures that will hopefully influence where the investment will be spent. The introduction of Insight, an online benchmarking tool, should provide local authorities with the ability to compare their performance to other councils and then share good practice, one of the key recommendations of the Audit Scotland report. There are also plans to examine and learn lessons from other successful schemes, and one of these successful schemes, the London Challenge, without a doubt contributed significantly to the improvements we've seen in London's education system. According to a report in The Guardian, in 1997, only 16% of students gained five GCSEs at grades A to C, and this was in, the, in an area of the country which arguably has the most money in investment. Just two years after its launch, the London Challenge improved the performance of London schools to above the national average, and by 2010, Ofsted declared London had a higher proportion of good and outstanding schools than any other area in England. We can easily learn these lessons from the London Challenge and implement them in Scotland. And one of the most successful steps in the challenge was the appointment of a team of highly experienced advisors to support schools and local authorities. And these advisors acted as the first point of contact for improving monitoring and seeking financial or other forms of help. And in the light of this success story, I hope we would all agree that the announcement that the government's plan to appoint attainment advisors in each local authority area is a sensible move that will pay substantial dividends. In conclusion, there's no easy or quick fix for reducing the attainment gap, but we can see what challenges have been met elsewhere and learn from these lessons. The Scottish Government is having to fight hard against continuous and unprecedented austerity measures, measures which I need not remind the Chamber are failing dismally to improve the lives of ordinary people, the length and breadth of the country. Since the SNP came to office, we've seen improvements in the attainment gap as evidenced by the increase in the number of school leavers going on to positive destinations. There's more work to do, undoubtedly. But if we listen to advice from experts please. and those with experience, we'll be able to invest this funding where it will have the most impact. Thank you very much. Now I call on Jane Braxter to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be able to speak in this debate today and in particular to support Labour's amendment, which highlights the impact of inequality on educational attainment and the need for investment in frontline resources in those schools which are dealing with the highest levels of deprivation. 
Addressing the attainment gap in schools is a top priority for the Scottish Labour Party. We are developing a strategy with a focus on reducing this gap before children start school through increased and improved preschool provisions, removing barriers to young people's opportunities and learning at school, and supporting families directly through initiatives like family centres in the most deprived areas. So I welcome the Scottish Government's proposals to address the attainment gap, albeit after eight years in power, and I will closely monitor the outcomes of this approach. It's clear that local councils play a vital role in addressing inequality in educational attainment, not only by providing the building blocks of schools, staff and equipment, but also by providing leadership in setting policy priorities and making the spending choices which turn them into reality. And that reality can mean supporting families at home and in communities, investing in early years education and childcare, in providing safe and sustainable environments for play and sport, leadership in forging and supporting links between schools, colleges and local employers, and in supporting lifelong learning and help with literacy and numeracy. I am proud to highlight the work of one authority in my region, Fife, where a great deal of work is going on to improve outcomes in a number of areas for the children, young people and families. Fife has the third highest number of children living in poverty in Scotland. This is, however, a fact that can be masked by other factors, depending on how you present the figures, factors such as a significantly higher wealth in North East Fife. It's well documented that communities which exist right next to each other can be nevertheless report vastly unequal life chances, economic realities, and even life chances to each other. So if we're serious about tackling unequal educational attainment levels, then we must keep the most disadvantaged individuals and communities at the centre of our thinking. We must also look at particular support for schools where a very small number of pupils have achieved five good hires, amongst other factors. In some areas, we do need to do as much as possible to bring about change, so that young people have the best possible chance of a positive future. That's why I'm proud that Fife is currently building a new high school for the Leavenmouth area, one of the most disadvantaged areas in Fife and in Scotland. The new school will bring together pupils from the existing Buckhaven High School and Kirkland High School, this new school will have about the same numbers of pupils living in SIMD 1 and SIMD 2 areas as Clack Manager does as a whole. To be clear, that one school in Leavenmouth, no, that one school in Leavenmouth will have more pupils who live in deprivation than the entire number of pupils who live in deprivation in the whole of Clack Manager. Whilst the catchment area of the new school includes significant areas of deprivation, with very significant numbers of disadvantaged pupils, its sheer scale, a role of about 1,800 pupils, means that these would not be identified through a focus on average statistics based on local authority areas. That's why it's so important to understand local circumstances. The rationale for this development is to provide a single, purpose-built facility for the community with a clearly established sense of identity and ambition. It will provide single-site educational and training facilities and provide links in to local employers, allowing a clear focus on employability and life skills, this is precisely the sort of approach that is needed to successfully reduce inequality in life outcomes, including attainment and achievement. And that starts at the earliest opportunity. A family nurture approach is increasingly being used across Fife to improve life chances for vulnerable families by providing effective support with child development and attachment. The approach is based on learning from and developing what works. Although in its early stages, it's already showing early indications of success. Engagement with and provision of support to vulnerable families has increased. There's also evidence of improving outcomes, for example, improvements in readiness for primary school. There's evidence that Fife is beginning to break the cycle of disadvantage in literacy skills. Whilst literacy, literacy attainment for S4 pupils rose in all social contexts, the increase was significantly, significantly greater in Fife's most deprived areas, an achievement that is attracting national attention. But it remains unacceptable that any child should leave a Scottish school in the 21st century without being able to read and write properly. And that's why Scottish Labour will introduce a new literacy programme that will also see support offered to parents so that they can learn with their children. Fife is working to ensure that all school leavers progress to a positive destination, equipped with key skills, evidence through attainment and wider achievement. An important part of that is the learning environment, which must engage all children and young people and equip them for positive life outcomes, regardless of their social context. Fife Council has delivered outstanding new education facilities, Dunfermline High School, 
Ochmuti High School, Carnegie Primary School and Burnt Island Primary School. There are new high schools underway in Kirkcaldy, Anstruther and, as I mentioned, Leavenmouth. These new facilities will ensure that Fife is better able to equip young people with employment skills needed in the modern economy. We now need the Scottish Government to support to ensure that the teaching within them is the best it can be. Deputy Presiding Officer, I hope I've shown that an awareness of the factors which contribute to inequality in educational attainment, combined with a willingness to target resources where they're most needed, is a sure way to close the gap. Scottish Labour's vision is to create communities where fairness and fulfilment can be achieved for all children and young people. Thank you. I now call Kevin Stewart to be followed by Richard Lyle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I uh, welcome the £100 million Attainment Scotland Fund. Uh, and while we are making progress in reducing the attainment gap, uh, we must recognise that we can only go so far in mitigating the damage caused by UK government policies. The priorities of Westminster seem to be continuing the policies of austerity, continuing to allow tax avoidance and continuing to spend £100 billion on a new generation of weapons of mass destruction. I believe our priority should be to eliminate austerity, invest in our public services and to create a fairer, more equal society. We know that an additional 100,000 Scottish children will be living in poverty by 2020 because of UK welfare reforms. And this is before the next round of cuts that are due in 2017-18 are taken into account. In my opinion, it is galling that due to the decisions of the UK government, children and families here are suffering greatly. This is why the Scottish Government's submission to the Smith Commission called for more powers and set out the need for Scotland to have full responsibility over welfare. The Scottish Government's child poverty strategy for Scotland expressed its commitment to focus on the need to tackle the long-term drivers of poverty through early intervention and prevention, partnership and holistic services. I'll give way to Mr Gray. Ian Gray. Could I have Ian Gray's microphone, please? Oh. Oh. Ian That's Gray. what happens when you leave. My apologies uh, to Mr Stewart. Uh, the Smith Commission did, however, agree that income tax should be devolved to this Parliament and will be when it is. Uh, would he support our suggestion that a 50p tax rate be invoked and some of that be used to address the attainment gap? Kevin Stewart, I'll give you some extra time. Thank you, President Officer. What I would like to see is things like the minimum wage and all welfare devolved here. I'm glad that taxation is going to be uh, devolved here. And as I've, said, uh, as I've said in this chamber previously, uh, one of the things which I cannot understand is why Labour Party voted to reduce that top rate of tax in the first place. Um, only full powers over welfare minimum wage and social policy will allow us to tackle child poverty and allow Scotland to become a fairer country. Only full responsibility over tax and national insurance will allow us to create jobs and build a more prosperous Scotland that is necessary to support our, our ambition for a fairer society. In our speech, as has already been said, uh, on the Scottish Achievement Challenge, the First Minister reiterated the target that she set out when she uh, came to office. That a child born today in one of our most deprived communities will, by the time he or she leaves school, have the same chance of going to university as a child born in one of our most affluent communities. This task would be much easier if we held all of the levers of power required to tackle poverty and create fairness in our society. There has been much talk of various projects uh, which have helped uh, in terms of uh, increasing uh, attainment. And I would commend uh, the Reading Bus, which has been a project uh, which has uh, been about Aberdeen for some time, uh, which has led to improvements in literacy. Uh, and I would uh, urge the, the new Cabinet Secretary to come visit Aberdeen at a point and see what the Reading Bus has been doing uh, in deprived communities uh, throughout Aberdeen, because I do think that the lessons uh, can be learned from that project. I also applaud the efforts of uh, bodies such as the North East of Scotland College, 
uh, and Robert Gordon University for collaborating in 2 plus 2 courses, which allow students, many from poorer backgrounds, the opportunity uh, and flexibility of experiencing further education before moving on to higher ed education uh, and gaining their degree. I also applaud uh, the University of Aberdeen run schemes such as S6 at uni uh, and aim for uni and for their invo involvement in Aspire North. Aberdeen also has a, a renowned summer school for access programme which I benefited from a, a number of years ago. The programme allowed me and others aged 18 to, to 80, many from poorer backgrounds, to take part in an intensive programme over a short period of time to gain access to university. The way the course was designed instilled camaraderie among students, had inspirational lectures and tutors, and often led to mo moments of epiphany about what you could aspire to and achieve. Unfortunately, I didn't finish my degree because I was flat broke and I returned to work, but many, many did and have moved on to much greater things. I would say uh, 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 to the Scottish Government that they should uh, look at some of the, the, the comments that Universities Scotland have made um, and they've asked for our support in encouraging the Scottish Funding Council to look beyond the limitations of SIMD as a focus and as a measure for widening access to university. I would urge the Scottish Government, as well as the Scottish Funding Council, to look beyond just the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation when allocating funding to boost attainment and widening access across the country. In Aberdeen, we have poverty amidst plenty, and often poor people do not live in the SIMD-identified poorest data zones. We cannot, should not, and must not forget this fact, and must do all that we can to help ensure that all less well-off folk have the help that they need to aspire to greater things. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. I now call Richard Lyle to be followed by Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Throughout the education sector in Scotland, we can see many examples of excellence and high achievement from our schools to colleges and universities. And as Jane Baxter has just said, we also see many new schools in Fife and Scotland being built by this SNP government. We should take pride in our higher education sector, which deserves to be called great. That said, however, the Independent Commission on School Reform suggested that although our schools are very good, there is always room for improvement. Improvements can be delivered. Indeed, I know that this government is one that listens. And that is why the government has set its sights on making these improvements, so that our schools can, without any doubt, be called great. This is being done to improve the opportunities for every child in this country, to ensure that we meet that vision of Scotland being the best place to grow up. We all need Scotland schools to be the very best, because they provide the foundation for further progress in life, be that through attaining college, university, or through employment, training, and modern apprentice schemes. Our school system is, I would suggest, the root of this country's current and future success. A child born today, as already has been said, in one of our most deprived communities should, by the time he or she leaves school, have the same chance of going to university as a child born in one of our most affluent communities. Our, child, our children deserve the best, and we should all join to make sure that they get the best. Scotland is a nation which values education and has done throughout its rich history. In essence, we are a learning nation, filled with innovation, creativity and passion. Above all, as this debate shows, passion. I understand that the Scottish Government have a long-term plan for success with the introduction of the Curriculum for Excellence, a curriculum which tackles issues of bureaucracy, unnecessary paperwork in order to free teachers to concentrate on what they do best. The delivery of teaching and learning, and we must resist any attempts to change that. It is widely known that the success of any country's education system is dependent upon the quality of its teachers and the education leadership. High quality people in teaching achieve high quality outcomes for children in education. And this government, I am sure, has taken the steps to further enhance the excellence that exists in our teaching profession. It is my belief that Scotland must offer not just good but great education to all. And when we face difficulty in doing this, we must redouble our efforts to overcome the attainment gap. 
This does not mean that improving access to university or colleges is as important that it is, but it is also about ensuring that all of Scotland's children and young people are engaged in education at all le levels so that they have the skills needed to succeed in work and life. We must do all we can to equip tomorrow's citizens. With this in mind, and it, it, it is, was with uh, great interest that I read the announcement of the new £100 million fund to improve education outcomes last week by the First Minister, which aims to drive forward improvements on education outcomes in Scotland's most disadvantaged communities. This fund, over four years, as already has been said, will focus on improving literacy, numeracy, health and wellbeing in primary schools, with the clear objective being to provide all our primary school pupils, regardless of their background, the best start in life. The schools in these areas will benefit from great access to expertise and resources, including additional teachers, materials for classrooms or resources to develop new out-of-school activities. The fund will also allow bespoke improved plans which are appropriate to local circumstances to be agreed for each school or groups of schools. Great things are also happening in our schools. But by providing this great access to funding, expertise and resources, schools will have more opportunity to offer the creative and innovative teaching that helps young people in Scotland succeed. This new fund, along with this government's policies, programmes, which include, uh, as I already said, Curriculum for Excellence, Teaching Scotland's Future, Getting It Right for Every Child, Early Years Framework and Opportunities for All, clearly sets out what needs to be done to support every child and young person in their journey from early years through school and post-16 learning, which include college and university. And I use the word journey quite deliberately, presiding officer, because all our young people, it is just that. I know that young people find themselves going through school and then coming to choose whether they should go to college, to university, or indeed to employment or training. In my own region, North Lancashire, for example, the Activity Agreement or 16 Plus Learning Hub provides the opportunity for access to training, employment opportunities or support in becoming a modern apprentice, something which this Government has a record on delivering on. The Hub supports our young people, meeting their needs, providing personal programme for, of learning, activity through a person-centred learning and development approach. This shows that here in Scotland, we adapt, we work with young people. And I believe that it shows we are committed to recognising learning as a journey from school to further education, employment or training. Well, this government is doing all it can to arrange attainment. It is, as already has been said, it's hindered by the policy of, of Westminster, additional 100,000 Scottish children living in poverty by 2020. Presiding officer, this is unacceptable. Despite this government's best efforts to alleviate the pressures on families, that is a result of decisions of UK government, children and families are being suffering, are suffering, and it should change. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Mark Griffin to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you, President Officer. Addressing the attainment gap in our schools is, has to be one of our top priorities, and we welcome the Scottish Government's recently announced plans to tackle it after eight years in government. Educational inequality is a symptom of a deeper problem of poverty, which we need to address. And so the focused nature of any programme is vital. A living in Cumbernauld and the variation in educational attainment across the town is massive. In the Council Ward of Cumbernauld North, the child poverty level is 8%, far too high. But when you cross over the footbridge um, across the M80 into Cumbernauld South, a two-minute walk, Child poverty then jumps to a staggering 23%. And as I've said, that difference in child poverty then impacts on the educational attainment of young people, which can stop them breaking out of that vicious cycle of poor health and low pay. The measures that we agree to tackle attainment have to be focused on our most deprived communities as a result. With that in mind, Scottish Labour would use the additional revenues from a new 50p tax rate, redistributing resources from those who can afford it to those who need it most, something that SNP members seem to be avoiding talking about at all, talk, all costs. Um, that additional 
£25 million per year, over and above the Government's proposals, would supplement that, that programme. We would double the number of teaching assistants in every primary school associated with the 20 secondary schools facing the greatest challenges of deprivation. We would introduce a new literacy programme for schools and recruit and, re recruit and train literacy specialists to support pupils in the associated primary schools and first and second year pupils in each of those 20 secondary schools. We would also support um, parents so that they can learn with their children and we will introduce a special literacy support programme for looked after children. We would ask Education Scotland to carry out an annual review on progress in tackling edu educational inequality in Scotland's schools through the Schools Inspectorate programme. That would include a, a specific report on looked after children and the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning would also report to the Parliament on the progress made annually on reducing the attainment gap to allow the progress to be monitored and scrutinised. There are also other, other issues related to poverty and inequality which are impacting on educational attainment, like the increase in the use of private tutors and use of the placing request system in our schools. There has been a 300% increase in the use of private tutors in the last year alone, and wealthier families have the ability to give their child an extra boost compared to children and families who can't afford that private tuition. That can be used when a, a child is struggling in a particular subject or help in the run-up to exams, and in itself isn't a bad thing. But where is the support for the pupil from the poorer background when they're struggling with a particular subject or need that support during exam time? We have supported provision of high quality wraparound care for primary school pupils like the provision of breakfast clubs and homework clubs to give pupils a productive start and end to their day um, whilst supporting the needs of working parents. That would give all pupils, regardless of their family income, that extra support in, in their learning. Supported study sessions are often run in schools at evenings and exam times to support pupils, but that is offered by committed, motivated teachers who offer up their own time to support the pupils that they care about. That, that is an excellent way of supporting pupils at exam time, but it is patchy across the country and across subjects. And There is an issue of transport costs for pupils who would normally get the school bus home but then can't afford um, alternative means. The other issue I wanted to talk about was the placing request system. Um, also creating a, a two-tier system of education and is causing problems for education authorities in managing school staff in the school estate. As soon as a, a school starts to get a perception or perhaps unfairly a reputation of slipping or failing um, or another school in the area perhaps starts to get a reputation for excellence, um, parents who have the means will start to pay for transport for their children to move out of their catchment area to an alternative school. I have seen that happen in, in my own authority in, in North Lanarkshire Council. And what we are left with is a situation in some schools where only the children from the poorest families in the area attend. And the, the impact on that attainment is clear. Yep. Liz Smith. I, give, I think the thank the member for giving way. That is an interesting point uh, he makes. Would he accept that there is a real need to, to ensure that those schools who are perhaps not doing quite so well are driven up in standards? And would the Labour Party consider the offer of uh, additional payments to staff who would teach in these schools? Mark Griffin. Yep, I mean, we've, we've spoken about reintroducing the Chartered Teacher Scheme to, to give yeah. teachers in those schools that incentive. Yeah. Um, and those, those schools that, uh, I don't like to use the word failing schools, um, but those schools that are facing the, the extreme challenges of deprivation and uh, that we're seeing um, placing requests, um, reducing the school role and, and re reinforcing that cycle of, of low, and low attainment. Uh, President officer, I'm glad the government are making educational attainment a priority after eight years in government. I hope that they will look at the areas where our proposals can improve those plans by redistributing wealth 
and increasing the resources available. And I look forward to working with the government on some of the other issues that I've mentioned um, to tackle educational inequality. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Sandra White to be followed by John Mason. Thank you very much, President Officer. And can I thank the Scottish Government for putting forward the motion? I think uh, attainment in schools uh, for the purpose of uh, particularly young kids is an absolutely excellent subject uh, to debate. And can I also thank the Cabinet Secretary for the recognition that education can be a postcode lottery and that the way forward to attain equality and delivery of education must be through strong leadership, high quality learning, and teaching to enable all of our children to reach their full potential. I do want to touch on the Labour Party's amendment and Ian Gray's contribution, uh, which did mention the importance of early years learning and the importance of tackling the attainment gap, uh, particularly in our most deprived communities. And as indeed the Cabinet Secretary already mentioned that, as did the Conservative amendment also. So it seems that we do have a cross-party support on that particular issue. But everything else, however, <laughs> I do take issue with uh, the Labour and Conservatives on a number of issues. And I do have to ask uh, the Labour Party, uh, if you wish to tackle the attainment gap, I mean, why did you vote against the additional £20 million put forward by John Swinney in the budget? Uh, two minutes. Yeah. Sorry. Did you give away? Be angry. Yeah. Frankly, this argument which says that if we vote against... We voted against the budget because it failed our health service, it failed our colleges and it failed local, go local government. Frankly, the argument that says, therefore, we voted against everything in it is juvenile. Santa Pate. Uh, well, Mr Gray is the one who mentions juvenile. I presume he's talking about his own party there. Uh, you mentioned the fact you want to give extra money, but you vote against £20 million. I think that's pretty uh, juvenile as well. As uh, someone said, Labour says no. And uh, can, can I also remind the Labour Party, I think they've got to be reminded about this, you're constantly going about the deprived areas, and that's absolutely correct, and we need to target monies into these areas. But let's not forget, and I think the Labour Party tries to forget, especially in the Glasgow area where I represent and come from, most of the deprived areas that you talk about with low attainment, unfortunately, have been ruled by Labour for decades. And Glasgow City Council also, please, you know, you don't need to lecture people on poverty. You have done nothing about it for the decades that you've controlled parts of Glasgow. And I think you should really hang your head in shame in that particular one. I want to just touch on the Conservatives, uh, not just the amendment, but the contribution. And, and I take on board the genuine, you know, what Mary, and, and other, Mary Scanlon has said and Liz Smith. But you've got to look at the situation in these areas that you're targeting for poverty. You're talking about benefit changes. You're talking about austerity. How do you think that's going to help these people to get out of the poverty that they're in? And I ask you just to, to think about that one in particular. Uh, presiding officer, uh, I want to use what time I do have uh, remaining in or left to give an example in my own constituency of a school and an early year centre uh, which have very high attainment, both of them, but is being threatened by the actions of Glasgow City Council, Hillhead Primary and the Early Year Centre. Now, a school which was created from the closure of four primary schools and now is, one of the lar is the largest primary school in Glasgow, so large, in fact, that it cannot cope. So overcrowded that classroom space, ICT, art and drama, toilet provision even, are all compromised. Now, yes, there was consultation. I went along to these consultations, absolutely amazed. Uh, some of the nursery schools were left out of the consultation. The numbers didn't even add up. And some of the parents who went along to these, all they could see was basically, it's an absolute sham. But yes, I went through the motions and the consultation was there. What have we got now? What we have now is a divided community, unfortunately. We've got the Early Years Centre, the Shearer Campus, we've got the Early Years Centre, and we have Hillhead Primary. Two excellent facilities with very high attainments. One of the ideas of Glasgow City Council was to take the kids from the final years of the primary and send them to Hillhead High School and create extra space in the, in the grounds of Hillhead High School. Now, the headmaster there and others there, that's pretty overcrowded as well. So they didn't actually look at that. Thankfully, we managed to get a call in in Glasgow City Council and the Greens and the SNP councillors spoke against this particular issue and said that we had to look at the whole issue again. But no, it fell. Labour Party majority won again. Now we have a situation where 
the, the actual people get in, the pupil numbers has been capped, the catchment area has been changed, someone who stays across the road who used to fill the, the catchment area can't go to the school anymore. So it's a sticking plaster which has been put over something which should have been looked at long ago. It will come back year after year after year for that whole area. Now, I had a look at some of this stuff and I have written to the Cabinet Secretary, as have the schools and the, and the parents also. Now, under Scottish Parliament guidance, or Scottish Government guidance, it states that a school with 22 class bases should have a minimum of four GP rooms. Hillhead Primary has one. The ICT is poor. There is no ICT suite. And now we see the same happening on the south side of Glasgow in an area in Mary Lee and the surrounding areas also. What I want to do is, by highlighting this, I said to the parents I would certainly highlight it, I wanted to ask the Cabinet Secretary, if possible, she would meet with me to discuss these issues. It's very, very important. It's not going to go away with a sticking plaster. And it's very sad you get two excellent facilities, excellent attainment, who now, whilst they share a campus, now don't speak. And I think that's really sad. And I do blame Glasgow City Council for the lack of foresight in what's happened to create the biggest school in Glasgow, but the problems it's also created. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. And I now call John Mason to be followed by Siobhan McMahon. Hey, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And it's always good to start off, I think, on a positive note, although I realise these debates focus more often on what is wrong and needs improving rather than what is going well. But clearly our education system is the envy of many countries around the world. And that is one of the reasons for immigration to Scotland, because many people from poorer countries want a better life for their children and they will go to great lengths to bring their kids here so that they can benefit from our education system. And it is that hunger for education from whole families, parents for their children, children for themselves, that sometimes seems to be missing in some of our homegrown families. In fact, I think we have probably all heard eh, about teachers talking about how when children have come to their schools from asylum-seeking families, refugee families, immigrant families, that can be a real boost to the whole school. And that enthusiasm for education can rub off on some of the Scots kids too. And in that theme of having whole families involved, eh, I have to say I was very pleased to see in the government motion mention of parental engagement. Eh, and I have to say I was somewhat disappointed that in the Conservative amendment there is no mention of parents or families whatsoever. Of course, the amount of money and the number of teachers have to be key factors in raising attainment and narrowing the attainment gap. And that is especially the case when a youngster has a more difficult background and we are looking to the school to make up some of the shortfall. I just find it very difficult to accept the COSLA argument that there is no link between teacher numbers or pupil-teacher ratio and attainment. I totally accept that teacher numbers are not the only factor, but surely they are a factor. But I go into both the primary and secondary schools, and especially if there's two primary sevens together, which means 50 or 60 youngsters, it is a real challenge to engage with them all at the one time. Nurture groups seem to have been a real success in some of the schools for bringing on kids who have extra challenges and hopefully having them catch up with the main class. And fundamental to such a nurture group, as I understand it, is that there is a small number of pupils with pretty intensive support from a teacher. So again, it seems clear that a better pupil-teacher ratio has to bring benefits, even if it is not the whole answer. I thought the Includum briefing for today's debate was very helpful, with its emphasis on child-parent relationships, child-school relationships, and parent-school relationships. If, for example, they say eh, that their, their work eh, includes proactive work with parents to set boundaries and manage difficult behaviour at home, work with parents to access help for health, housing, finance and other problems eh, which undermine their own capacity eh, to help the young people and work with parents on their attitudes to education and responsibilities, giving them the confidence to engage with education. However, the included approach obviously is fairly intensive and is quite expensive and could not be used eh, on a terribly wide scale. Speaking to the head teacher of one of my local secondaries, they said it is often like having two separate schools within the one building. Partly the split is based on deprivation and the area the pupils are coming from. But very importantly, too, is the split between youngsters who have parental support and those who do not. And that does not always simply reflect the level of deprivation. 
seeing one or both parents going to work every day has a huge impact on young people and their expectations and aspirations. Confidence or lack of it can be a factor here too. For example, where parents have not had a good experience at secondary school and this gets passed on to the next generation. Moving on to some of the practical issues relating to schools, I do think there has been too much emphasis perhaps in the past on the academic. And to some extent, we've moved away from that, which is good. And the emphasis on modern apprenticeships, I think, is excellent. Uh, yes, sir? Joanne Lamond. Would you not agree also, however, there's been not enough emphasis on the academic abilities of some of our poorer children and that actually they've been denied opportunities, for example, by schools setting up situations where you can't sit five hires in particular schools? Surely that's another disadvantage. We shouldn't presume that every child who comes from a deprived background is more prone to go and do a vocational course. John Mason. Absolutely. I think it's a question of having the, the, the right approach, the right support and the right opportunities for every child. So I totally... Uh, agree with that. Uh, at the same time, I would say we do not want a country with 100% university graduates. I do not believe that would be good for the country or for all of our individuals. And in practice, it's clear that many top earners are in fact not graduates, and also many graduates are not finding jobs to match their degrees, and therefore not earning what they had hoped. We need a whole range of skills to make our society work, and how these skills are acquired may well vary considerably. I also wonder if schools are pointing youngsters in the right direction as far as careers are concerned. We had a high school in Parliament recently from the East End of Glasgow, and I asked, first of all, how many girls are planning to go into engineering, and the answer was none. And I then asked how many boys were planning to go into engineering, and the answer again was none. Now, it's all very well young people going in, being interested in politics and taking degrees in that subject, but then they find there is a lack of job. And I do wonder if that's the kind of attainment we're aiming for. The Conservative amendment talks of more trained science teachers, but I think part of the answer has to be more ex and better exposure between young people and the workplace. That can either be by experience in the workplace or with business people and engineers and so on going into the schools. Presiding officer, it's good that we have modern school buildings, ICT equipment, all the rest of it. But I remain convinced that it is the school teacher or the college teacher who is key to the whole agenda. We all know of or have heard of a teacher who has gone beyond the call of duty and invested time and interest in one young person, and that has turned their life around. So whatever we do, please let us keep investing in teachers. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Siobhan McMahon to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to take part in this afternoon's debate, and I also welcome the investment by the Scottish Government over the next four years for the Attainment Scotland Fund. I have no doubt that the Government are sincere in their pursuit to reduce the attainment gap in Scotland. I welcome the initiatives that the current and former Cabinet Secretary have announced regarding this, and I hope that we can all work together in this chamber to make sure that real progress is made in this area. In order to do this, I believe that we have to be more realistic about what we will achieve and how we can do this. For instance, I cannot see how the current strategy can truly benefit every child and young person in Scotland. As I have said before, this is an ambition that the Cabinet Secretary and I share. However, as she will recall, we have disagreed on this subject before because I think we have to focus more on individual need rather than a collective approach. The Cabinet Secretary will recall that I made the point to her in the many debates we had on the current Modern Apprenticeship Programme, but she may also be aware that I made similar points during the passage of the Children and Young Persons Bill. It is a point I maintain and I will expand on now. Children with additional needs, in particular those with a learning and or physical disability, sometimes require a different approach than other children and young people need. Simply providing a space for a child to learn, such as a learning hub, may be beneficial for children who require a space away from home to do their homework, but won't help a child who requires additional one-on-one -on -one support in order to complete the same tasks. I know that members in the Chamber will recognise this, however, we have to do more than simply recognise. It is because at the moment it is these children that are getting left behind and as a result see their life chances diminishing in front of them. As including said in the briefing for today's debate, our vision is that young people and their families are supported with targeted and personalised wraparound support as part of a core school provision and that those children who face the greatest barriers to their involvement in education are given the support they need so they can achieve their full potential. Whilst we welcome additional funding for and focus on raising attainment, it is important that the implementation of this policy focuses not, not just on the school experience, but the whole approach, 
taking to engaging children and young people in education. I believe that in order to achieve this vision, a vision that I and many members in the Chamber will share, we have to invest in more classroom assistance. Classroom assistance are crucial if we are to achieve any form of progress with regards to the attainment gap. Without them, our teachers simply do not have the time to dedicate to those who require the most support. Without supporting investment like this, we cannot say that we are truly getting it right for every child in Scotland. I know that the Scottish Government are focusing on the link between poverty and educational attainment, and I welcome this. However, what we should recognise is that children with a disability are more likely to come from a deprived background and therefore require more support. That is why it is so crucial that the support we offer is tailored to a child's needs rather than taking a homogeneous approach. I do not believe that this is the best way of tackling the problems that children and young people are currently facing, nor do I believe that it is the best use of public money. Poverty is regrettably linked to educational attainment. As Save the Children stated in their briefing, children living in poverty are twice as likely as other children to start school already behind in their learning and development. They too believe that we should have a more targeted approach and have a focus on those from a deprived background. Whilst I welcome this suggestion, I would offer a note of caution to the Cabinet Secretary, as focusing on a deprived background does not mean focusing on someone's postcode. I say this because I am concerned that the Government's approach to getting more people from derived backgrounds into university relies on a person's postcode and not simply their socio-economic status. This is a matter that I raised with the former Cabinet Secretary, as the policy has unfairly discriminated against my constituent. It is also a policy that was brought to my attention during a meeting last week, where it was pointed out to me that if the UK Government were to adopt the same policy as the Scottish Government, Prince George would be entitled to additional support, as his postcode is in a deprived area. I hope this example illustrates the note of caution I was issuing earlier. The Government and the Literacy Action Plan state that recent surveys have confirmed that literacy skills are linked to socio-economic status and level of deprivation, with those from more deprived areas achieving lower scores. In primary education, those from more deprived areas often fail to reach even basic standards of literacy. The action plan goes on to say that early intervention is a philosophy at the heart of our early years framework. During these critical years, it is parents who will have the greatest impact on their child's literacy skills. Where parents need additional support, GIRFEC, alongside guidance and supporting adult learners, will aim to ensure early and coordinated interventions by agencies who work together to meet the needs of children and their families. The Standing Literacy Commission was established in 2011, and I understand that it meets three times per year. I would be interested to know what role the Commission has in meeting the objectives set out in the Government's Literacy Action Plan, what progress the Commission has had in increasing literacy within our schools during this time, and what the role the Commission will play in helping to reduce the attainment gap. I would also be interested to know what examples of support parents and carers have been offered in order to achieve greater literacy skills. Finally, President Officer, the Wood Commission has highlighted a number of areas that the Government need to focus on with regards to reducing the attainment gap. Can the Cabinet Secretary, in her closing speech, perhaps expand on the areas she would like to see most focus on in the next year or so, and how this can be achieved? Thank you. Many thanks. And our final open debate speaker is Mark Macdonald. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, <clears throat> I, I welcome the, the funding announcement from the, the Scottish Government. Um, I think it is important that um, the approach towards attainment that is being uh, proposed by the Scottish Government is taken forward. At the same time, however, we must reflect on the fact that by the time a child arrives at the school gates, um, there are often factors that have influenced their life up to that point, which uh, the school can do little to, uh, to influence. Uh, there can be uh, work done, obviously, to help that child achieve above uh, what, what might otherwise be expected. But we should also recognise that many schools and many teachers are fighting against a situation outside of the classroom rather than working with that child to uh, make the best of their education. For example, wider influencing factors can revolve around, as we've, we've spoken about, the uh, situation in terms of poverty that can affect families, but also uh, in terms of local opportunities and also um, the groups within the, the circles within which that child has grown up. That's why I think parental involvement is a, a crucial issue that should be focused in on. But not just 
um, through the approach that was being suggested by, by some on the Labour benches. And, and, and I would say, you know, I, I thought Joanne Lamont's speech was excellent and, and made a lot of very constructive points. And I heard on the Labour benches talk of, for example, literacy and numeracy support for parents. And I think that is something where parents have those those needs identified, that is something we should look at. But I think also in terms of parental involvement happening through, for example, uh, promotion, much, much, much wider promotion at a local level of the play strategy that the Scottish Government has put forward. Because through parents uh, engaging in interactive play with their children and also putting their children into situations where they socially interact with other children at a young age, you uh, both allow children to take uh, a much greater interest in the world around them and become more open to learning experiences, but also you develop a social confidence within children that for many children uh, who arrive at school with some of the challenging backgrounds that we've spoken about in the Chamber today, that social confidence is not always there when they go to school and that can influence and impact on their ability to learn within a classroom environment. So that, I think, through using the play strategy as a vehicle, uh, promoting that more widely, I think will help. That's why facilities like the uh, community projects of Middlefield, Printfield uh, and for Sands and Fountain in my constituency are so important because they're working in some of our most deprived communities and bringing uh, young people, young children into environments where that kind of confidence, that kind of support can be provided to them. Indeed, I joined children from the Fursans Nursery in my constituency at the Aberdeen University Botanic Gardens as part of the We Green Spaces project, which was designed to encourage children to explore the natural environment. Taking children from an environment where they did not have a lot of green space uh, or outdoor environment in their locale uh, into an area where they could roam freely and enjoy the outdoors and, in, uh, and in, enhance uh, their enthusiasm for learning. Lord Liam MacArthur made an interesting point about uh, how you identify the, the needs uh, the, the, for, for the funding. Um, <clears throat> obviously, as a, uh, a constituency representative for the city of Aberdeen, I recognise that there is often an issue in Aberdeen where uh, we have examples of, of poverty amidst plenty. Uh, indeed, two of the schools in my constituency, Manor Park and Bramble Brace, sit within areas uh, of deprivation and had, uh, at the time that you could use free school meal data to identify children who were in low socioeconomic uh, status, uh, had uh, significant numbers of children who, are, who identified as qualifying for free school meals. But there are a number of things that have been done. Uh, for example, the Manor Park School has uh, benefited as a result of a new building, which provides a fantastic environment for learning. But there's also schools uh, like Cordice in my constituency, which uh, I visited recently, and is a school which is doing phenomenal work with children who are at the very margins of education, many of whom have backgrounds that many of us could not begin to fathom. Uh, and the uh, education system for them uh, has not worked, but the work that is being done at Cordice School is absolutely supporting those children. The future of the school at present is unclear because the Council's inclusion review uh, has uh, been taking place and we don't yet know the direction of travel that that will take, but I think it would be hoped that the ethos that exists within the school will be continued and replicated, even if perhaps the physical structures, which are becoming old and tired, are not themselves. Finally, and uh, Siobhan McMahon brought up the issue around children with additional support needs, and obviously this is an issue that uh, is close to my heart and something that I've done a lot uh, to, to raise within the Chamber. And I think that um, you know, it is absolutely important that we have the appropriate support available for children, but also that we have uh, the appropriate diagnosis in place at the earliest possible opportunity. Uh, I was interested by Stuart Maxwell's point around uh, literacy and looking at teacher training, and I would reissue my request uh, to the Scottish Government to look at how uh, additional support needs are factored into teacher training, particularly autism and dyslexia, which are often categorised as invisible support needs, uh, often those which require a specific understanding uh, of the conditions to be able to spot readily, because that will assist not just in terms of the support within the classroom, but also, crucially, can assist in, the, uh, in, in uh, enabling children to receive an appropriate diagnosis at an early stage, which allows that support to then be provided, because there are still too many children, presiding officer, who are not diagnosed until quite far into their education, and that can have a direct impact on the educational outcomes that that child achieved. So I hope that is something the Scottish Government will consider taking forward.
Thank you very much. We now turn to the closing speeches and I call on Liz Smith with up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, six years ago, at the time when the Scottish Conservatives had a seminar on attainment and school reform, the SNP told us that there was no need for any major changes because of the Curriculum for Excellence. Now, this was despite what Mike Russell had said in Grasping the Thistle, in which he seemed very much in favour of school reform in order to raise attainment, and what he also said in the Times Educational Supplement when he said that the Scandinavian free school model was well worth discussing, and I quote. But curiously, he went off that idea, and then he rejected outright the Swedish model of schooling in a parliamentary answer that he gave on the 9th of February 2012. Of course, the First Minister has now fine-tuned that, and we have a very substantial hint that she does actually believe that some school reform is essential if we are to drive up attainment. So just at the time where it looked that we might, in, in a minute, Cabinet Secretary, just as at the time where it looked as though we might have an intriguing situation where Nicola Sturgeon as First Minister uh, will actually be on the political right of the latter day Mike Russell, we then get the message from the First Minister that she's not in favour of any of the ideological nonsense that we get down south. Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. That, that's correct. We're not in favour of any of the ideological nonsense down south because we believe firmly and first and foremost uh, on going where, where the evidence is. And talking where the evidence is, I'd actually thought Sweden had uh, fallen out of favour with the Tories uh, given that they are below Scotland in all three measures, whether it's in maths, reading or science. Liz Smith. Well, could I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that? I think you'd better speak to your predecessor about that. But you know, actually... Nicola Sturgeon and Michael Gove are actually quite similar because as I understand Nicola Sturgeon from Scotland well if I understand Nicola Sturgeon from her article in Scotland on Sunday two weeks ago she was saying that she is interested in what works well so too was Michael Gove and we believe very firmly on this side of the house that it should not matter a jot who owns or runs a school so long as it delivers high standards of education so I think the SNP is beginning to move. And I think it is this document which has started to make them think again. Because as Ian Gray rightly said in his uh, very good speech, although I didn't agree with all of it, the facts in this Audit Scotland report are very stark indeed. And they expose just how deep-seated the attainment gap actually is and the entrenched educational inequalities that exist within our current system. But there are other facts too. In the international educational measurements like PISA, OECD or TIMS, Scotland has not been performing as well as other countries, even although there are some very good things happening in Scottish education. Keir Bloomer, when he was examining the case for school reform, produced hard evidence which showed that in the areas of reading science and maths, our international PISA performance was worse in 2012 than it was in 2000. And just before Christmas, he warned again that there isn't much sign of any meaningful recovery. But aside from these facts, however, there are some, very other, some other very interesting things that are happening. Sir Ian Wood's commission made plain the need to introduce much greater diversity into education. I'm delighted the Education Committee is looking at this. Because if we are to ensure that all children have the opportunity to develop their own talent in the way that Joanne Lamont set out in her excellent speech, we have to ensure that they can do that. His work examined in detail what needs to happen in the field of vocational training and it has been hugely influential and it's put added pressure on the Scottish Government as has the hot water in which they have got themselves because of the extensive college cuts which happened at the very time when they told us that 16 to 19 education was their top priority. George Adam, Kevin Stewart and John Mason all spoke very sensibly about the need to ensure that this Parliament takes advantage of the collective wisdom of our colleges, universities and employers. We have to do that. And again, that is breeding more diversity in our system. But there is one other major driving force, and that is the message that is coming from local authorities. Time after time, they are telling the Scottish Government that they simply have not got the cash to maintain the current structure of education spending. In the last two weeks, we have seen a massive turf war between the Finance Secretary, John Swinney, and COSLA about how the existing money should be spent. I think that's an unedifying sight. And party politics aside, it's also clear demonstration of why the current system is not working that well. The COSLA, if, if in just a minute, 
the, the COSLA structure is under huge pressure because of all sorts of different demands on our education system. And that's shown by the fact that four or five local authorities look set to leave it. And the unthinkable is starting to happen. A few councillors, even the Labour Party, I understand, are beginning to question whether or not local authorities are actually the right people to take charge of education at this particular time. I give way to John Mason. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. She mentions Cosla. Does she agree with Cosla that there is no link between teacher numbers and improving attainment? Liz Smith. Well, I wouldn't say there's no link, but I certainly don't think it's the whole story. I think there's a whole uh, ramification of different interest in that. And, and I think, as Mary Scanlon rightly pointed out in her contribution, it's important that we look at the data and the, uh, the, the qualitative data. And I think Liam MacArthur uh, raised that point too. But let me come back and let me finish on this point. What matters is what works. What can deliver better educational attainment? If it means that it is a more diverse system, if it means that we have different kinds of schools and a different system and local authorities are no longer doing the job that they are doing just now, then so be it, because it's important that we drive up standards for every single pupil in Scotland, no matter where they come from. Thank you. And I now call on Ian Gray. Around nine minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer, I sometimes uh, wonder in these debates what uh, those brave enough to uh, sit in the public gallery uh, through them think, what the onlookers think of them. And uh, I'm not sure. I think they probably would have found this afternoon's debate a bit puzzling because uh, we've spent, I think, a fair bit of the afternoon violently agreeing with each other. Uh, it started quite uh, early with George Adams' uh, uh, speech, um, which, which featured a, a, a really impassioned peroration uh, which ended in the point that surely addressing the attainment gap is something that we can all support. And I make the point to Mr Adam that we are all supporting it. We are all this afternoon agreeing that this is a problem we must address. But there is a difference in how we've addressed it this afternoon. Every speaker from the opposition benches of whatever party has pretty fulsomely welcomed the attainment fund, welcomed the £100 million over the next four years. And broadly, I would say, uh, welcomed uh, how the Cabinet Secretary has outlined it's going to be spent. I think we've raised some questions about that and um, we, we need to see some more detail and I think there's more detail to be worked out. But broadly, uh, we have welcomed the attainment fund and indeed how it's going to be Spent. That has not, I'm afraid, been the case uh, with the uh, government benches. Uh, not one single SNP speaker has been able to bring themselves to rise to the challenge we set them to do more about this problem on which we are all agreed. Now, I always believed that one of the characteristics of an education was that it led to open-mindedness. I, I fear that has been singularly lacking on the government benches this afternoon, with perhaps the honourable exception of Mr Macdonald uh, late on uh, in the debate. Indeed, we've seen some painfully grim examples of closed-mindedness this afternoon. Mr Beattie, for example, denounced the Labour proposals because it would not apply in every school in Scotland, rather missing the point that the attainment fund he was welcoming will also not apply in every school in Scotland. Indeed, I think it won't apply in any of the schools that Mr Beatty uh, represents. And then we had Mr Stewart, to whom I directly offered the opportunity to support our proposals, and he refused, and then went on to complain uh, about the lack of attention that Aberdeen receives. Well, I say to Mr Stewart, I think under our proposal, at least one school cluster in Aberdeen would benefit although they won't benefit from the Scottish Government Attainment Fund. Well, Mr. Surely. Kevin Stewart. Would he, would he like to name the school cluster that would benefit from the Labour proposals? Ian Cray. No, but having looked at, no. The, no, but having looked at the way in which uh, these decisions can be made, I think that at least one school cluster. For the very point that Mr Stewart made, that Aberdeen is a wealthy and prosperous city, but that does not mean that within it there are no areas of significant deprivation. Um, I, I, I thought at least Mary Scanlon was honest 
Many Scotland said she can't support our proposal because she doesn't believe in taxing the better off at a higher rate. She doesn't believe in the 50p tax rate. Well, I tell you, if that is the SNP's position as well, then can they please be just as honest about it as uh, Mrs Scanlon is? And I hope the Cabinet Secretary will explain if that is indeed the reason that they can't support uh, our proposal. And returning to Mrs Scanlon, I thought she made a very thoughtful contribution. Uh, I certainly didn't agree with uh, a lot of the Tory close, but uh, Mrs Scanlon raised some important points about the need for robust data, uh, the fact that we don't have national testing. Now, I don't favour uh, uh, national testing in the sense that we used to have it, but I do think there is a debate to be had about what tests are made available for teachers to use uh, in particularly literacy and numeracy. Uh, and her overall point there, I think, was a lack of a theoretical basis for the way in which uh, the, fund, the funding would be spent. And indeed, other speakers, Cara Hilton, uh, Liam MacArthur, Joanne Laman, all talked about uh, uh, questions that we have to debate about how these funds should be spent and targeted and indeed what works. There's been much talk all around the Chamber of the London Challenge. The London Challenge featured an advisory board uh, for those schools involved in the challenge. It was very strong on school-to-school -school peer support uh, and the importance of data and using that data was also uh, core in any uh, evaluation of the London Challenge and its success. So here's a suggestion. As part of what we are doing in this new found commitment to addressing the attainment gap, why not create in Scotland a centre of excellence in educational equity, which would share best practice, which would allow and create peer-to-peer -peer support for the schools uh, in the areas that we've all talked about? Uh, uh, it would draw perhaps on the research and theoretical work already going on in our universities. Ms Scanlon talked about Professor Ellis, and there are others, of course, as well uh, involved in this work. This is about what is the scale of our aspiration on this matter. Rather than talk about being front runners, let's actually place ourselves in the forefront of educational thinking and theory and practice uh, in uh, addressing the uh, attainment. Uh, gap. And as for accountability, which was also core to the London Challenge, it's our view that uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary should come to Parliament every year and report on progress uh, on this core uh, task that we are setting ourselves. But I want to, to return in working towards a close to, um, to Mr Adam and Mr Stewart, because they both quoted the First Minister uh, and uh, uh, her aspiration and I welcome the scale of her aspiration. She has said that she wants it to be the case that a child born today, and I have a grandchild born last week, so this is pretty close to home, that a child born today, well, it's nothing to do with me, so. <laughs> um, a, a, a child born today uh, will have the same chance as everyone else by the time they leave school. That is a noble aspiration. But I tell you this, we will not make that transformation in the four years of the attainment challenge. We just simply will not. And this is why I think we will not. There's nothing new under the sun. Way back in 1978, I lived in Wester Hills in Edinburgh, and I was in teacher training, and I did a, a, a teaching practice in the Wester Hills Education Centre. It was the second year it had been opened. It was the most modern, best equipped school Scotland had ever seen. It had, in my view, the best, most highly motivated, most inspirational teaching cadre that I have ever seen in a single school. It had additional resources, more teachers than other schools, because it was one of four schools identified in Lothian region at that time as community schools. They were paid more than other teachers. They were on an alternative contract for which they were required to teach adults in the classroom and to teach evening classes for both adults and young people. They were required to maintain a relationship with parents as well as with uh, their uh, young people. But, you know, five years later, I got a job as a teacher now in one of the other community schools in Livingston this time in, in Veramond. And by that time, all of that had been eroded. 
I didn't get the alternative contract that had gone. There were no evening sessions. There were no adults in classes. These were good schools, but not different. And so all the advantages were lost. And my point is this. Our resources have to be targeted. They have to be substantial. And they have to be sustained over the long term if we are going to make the difference we want to see. That is why we say double this fund, make it permanent, and focus it ruthlessly. You know, Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can choose to change the world. We're agreed on what we want to do. The question is, how serious is this government about doing it? Let's combine the firepower of the government's proposals and ours. Let's get serious about changing the world. Let's really make the difference. Many thanks, and I now call on Angela Constance to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, you have until 4.59 p.m., it's around 12 minutes. Thank you very much, President Officer, and if I can commence my closing remarks today by uh, congratulating Grandad Gray. Um, he, of course, is quite correct to say that it's got nothing to do with him, although Although uh, I hope he takes his granddad duties very seriously and he's going to help out with the babysitting. Because we often talk about the role of parents uh, in our children's education uh, and in support of families. But of course the role of grandparents uh, is a very uh, important role. And I'm often uh, reminded uh, by constituents when I'm at the school gates uh, that grandparents uh, are indeed uh, the backbone of the Scottish economy. Uh, of course. I simply, wanted to, I simply wanted to say that that is a correct and powerful point and elegantly made. Well done. <laughs> Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to start by saying, Presiding Officer, is uh, I have enjoyed uh, the range of contributions made this afternoon, haven't agreed with every word that every contributor has made, but it has been a debate notable uh, that individuals have spoke about their own experiences of education and indeed their own experiences of working in the, the front line of education. And I think many members uh, across the political spectrum have demonstrated their own particular uh, passions uh, for education. Now, if I can say to some members, uh, Joanne uh, Lamont, who raised uh, a point with respect to kinship carers, there is a number of issues being worked through in response to a Supreme Court ruling, and I would urge her to speak to the uh, Acting Minister for Children and Young People for uh, an update on that point. But the point that she makes that what we do within our classrooms is powerfully important in terms of quality of teaching and that quality of teaching and learning that our children experience, but also what happens outside the school debates. The school gates is imperative to this debate as well, and we know that poverty most certainly does not stop uh, at the school gate. To Stuart Maxwell, can I say that uh, initial teacher education does indeed vary uh, immensely, uh, and I am happy to speak to uh, providers of initial teacher uh, education, particularly uh, in the point he raises with regards to uh, primary schools. Uh, to Kevin Stewart, I am of course happy to visit the Reading Bus uh, in Aberdeen and happy to meet with Sandra White and indeed uh, any other member if they have particular issues that they wish to discuss uh, and pursue. It was... Um, a notable part of today's debate that uh, people largely accepted that Scottish education is improving. We do all have that shared ambition uh, for Scotland to be the best place to learn. Uh, the focus of the debate today has been about how we take a good education system and make a great education system for all uh, of our children. And I want to highlight a remark from uh, Andy Hargreaves, uh, who is based in the School of Education uh, in Boston College, and a comment that he made uh, in The Scotsman um, a year or two ago. And he said that the great strength of Curriculum for Excellence is that it encourages innovation and learning and discretion for teachers, which of course is quite different uh, from what happens south of the border, where teachers have become very constrained by testing. And he then went on to say what Curriculum for Excellence is trying to do is both catch up with the best in the world and even lead the pack. And that has to be our shared ambition that we want to collectively move forward and lead the pack. Now, we know from PISA studies that the decline in standards in Scottish education 
has been halted and that there even has been some progress in closing the gap in terms of math, reading and science. Something that I will point out that Labour failed to do when you compare the PISA results in a, minute, in a moment, when you look at the PISA results uh, 2003 to 2006. But actually the point I want to make is I'm not that interested in the past because the barometer of the past and, and to use the past as a baseline is just simply not good enough and that our aspirations have to be about looking to the future and looking to a greater future for all our children. Ian Gray. It's a similar point, really. Will the Cabinet Secretary not recognise that the, the closing the gap in the PISA results is really because of a reduction at the top end? And that isn't how we want to close the gap. We want to raise those at the bottom. And that's where we should be looking in the future. Cabinet Secretary. The point I was going to go on to make uh, that Mr Gray might be interested is we can look at a range of headline figures whether it's the OECD PISA studies, uh, whether it's tariff scores relating to exam results, uh, whether it's literacy and numeracy surveys, school leaver destinations, exclusions. And we can look at all that and look at the headlines and see improvement. And of course, we can look at, for example, uh, looked after children and see that they've made the biggest improvement. But what we are seriously about is raising attainment for all and closing uh, the equity gap. That, that gap between the children from the least and the most uh, disadvantaged backgrounds, because it can't be acceptable that in the Scotland we seek, that in the Scotland of today, that some children are quite simply uh, left behind. And the gap, that gap still exists. We're not going to deny that. And that gap is way too large. We're not going to demure from that, because our challenge as we move forward is about not leaving any any child behind. And we know that the gap starts early. We know that by the time that some children are five years old, that, that gap in terms of their vocabulary and their literacy can be as much as 13 months within five-year-olds. That is absolutely massive. And we know that if that gap is left unattended to, that it will grow as a child progresses uh, throughout its education system. So what I would say to Leo MacArthur is in the work that we are doing in the early years, we are building uh, very strong uh, foundations and we are moving forward at a pace, but it is a, a balanced uh, expansion. And what we're not going to do is what has happened south of the border, where people have over-promised but under-delivered on the implementation um, of, of, of childcare. Certainly. Liz Smith. Uh, Given the, uh, what the First Minister said in her article, is the Scottish Government willing to accept that wherever there is progress and what works, whether it comes from down south or anywhere else in the world, it is something that would be worked in Scotland? Cabinet I actually think that, with respect, Ms Smith, I have made that point actually very clearly throughout my contribution to, to date. To date. Um, I am not an ideologue, I am a pragmatist. I will always look at the evidence wherever it is, whether that is uh, south of the border, uh, whether it is Ontario, whether it is elsewhere in Europe or indeed uh, elsewhere uh, in, in the world. But the facts of the matter that some of the reforms that are happening down south are not backed up by the evidence. We've got a House of Commons uh, Education Committee report uh, published just in January that says there is no evidence that reforms or so-called reforms such as academies uh, and free schools are leading to an improvement in attainment. And it's also really interesting that the Chief Inspector of Ofsted talks about uh, schools, irrespective of the system they're in, whether it's local authorities or whether it's some chain of academies, being marooned within that structure and not being supported and not benefiting from the networks and the collaboration and that sharing of best practice, that sharing uh, of what works uh, on the classroom uh, in the front line. Uh, no thanks. I'm going to make some progress, Mrs Scanlon, perhaps later. And the point about the attainment challenge, uh, as announced by the First Minister, is it does indeed allow for a step change in progress because we want to pick up the pace now. But we are, of course, uh, looking to the future. We do need to look to the long term. And as politicians across this chamber, we have to have the courage to look to the long term and not take a short term view of education. But that doesn't get us off the hook. We need to pick up the pace substantially and we need to pick up that pace now. And £100 million is a significant investment uh, by anyone's standard. Now, 
As indicated in my opening remarks, we are not going to carte blanche import somebody else's uh, system, whether it's from down south or further afield. And what I learned, because um, you know, Liz Smith mentioned uh, the Young Workforce Commission. I was actually the minister that commissioned that work and who accepted uh, each and every one of the recommendations. And when you're looking at vocational education or whether it's school education, is that you can't cherry pick. You really need to look deeply and look and learn from what works. And the positive thing about the attainment challenge is that we will adapt it to a Scottish context. What we liked from uh, the London challenge uh, was it was flexible, it was based on local solutions, and ultimately it was based first and foremost on the needs of our children and also based on professional judgment and professional uh, dis dis discretion, which I hope no thanks, which I hope would overcome some of the concerns that Mark Griffin uh, described about children from poorer uh, income households facing in comparison uh, to uh, their better off peers. Now the resource of course is targeted. That is never uh, an easy uh, decision to make, uh, presiding officer. And I've identified the seven areas that will initially benefit uh, from this uh, funding. £20 million pounds this year, £100 million pounds, uh, over uh, the, four, the four years. And what we've done is we've looked to the areas that have the highest proportion of children from households in the Scottish Index in multiple deprivation, deciles one and two, those children from the 20% most disadvantaged households. And the attainment challenge will actually reach 50% of primary pupils in Scotland who are living in the 20% most deprived areas. And in an area like that in Glasgow, where one in four children uh, living in poverty actually live in Glasgow. This is a very significant investment targeted, but I don't doubt will indeed have a very significant uh, impact. And it is important, and I think the point that Mary Scanlon raised, um, if I can reassure her, is we're not just chucking money. Um, we will be you know, looking at very bespoke uh, improvement plans. We want to intelligently use information that is gathered at that local level in the classroom. As she knows, we are not interested, no, we're not interested in national testing. I've been very generous with my time uh, today, Mrs Scannon. We're not interested in national testing. We will, of course, look to see what additional data and information is proportionate and is going to be meaningful and will allow us to make judgments about what works and inform our practice um, as we uh, move forward. Presiding officer, uh, in conclusion, I want to make the point that what this government is about in terms of our education system is about both equity and excellence. It is utterly wrong to believe that an equitable educational system uh, that provides equal chances for children and young people cannot also uh, be excellent. And Andrea Schlesher, the Director of Education and Skills of the OECD, pointed this out in a very recent article on the BBC News when he said international comparisons show there is no incompatibility between the quality of learning and equity and the highest performing education systems combine both. They combine excellence and equity and that presiding officer is what we are about, is about excellence and equity. And the very, very final point I want to make, presiding officer, is that everybody in this chamber will all have children and young people in their lives and what we must continue to inject in education policy and indeed in all aspects of public policy is to desire, is to want for all of Scotland's children what we want for our own children and we have to believe that all of our children can achieve and reach their full potential and that applies to looked after children, it applies to children with additional support needs because at the end of the day all of these children are our children and we all have to ensure that Scotland becomes the best place to learn and the best place to grow up. Thank you. That concludes the debate on raising attainment. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion number 12319. In the name of Michael Matheson on the Serious Crime Bill UK legislation, I call on Michael Matheson to move the motion. Cabinet Secretary. Moved. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put decision time. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 12318. 
In the name of Haley McLeod and the abolition of the Advisory Committee on Pesticides UK legislation, <coughs> I call on Haley McLeod to move the motion, Minister. Formally moved. Question on this motion will be put decision time. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 12320 in the name of Fiona Hyslop on the Scottish Minister's nominations to the European Economic and Social Committee of the European Union. I call on Fiona Hyslop to move this motion, Cabinet Secretary. Formally moved. Question on this motion will be put decision time to which we now come. <coughs> Sorry. There are six questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 12316.2. In the name of Ian Gray, which seeks to amend motion number 12316, in the name of Angela Constance, on raising attainment, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12316.2 in the name of Ian Gray is as follows. Yes, 26. No, 81. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 12316.1 in the name of Mary Scanlon, which seeks to amend motion number 12316 in the name of Angela Conson on raising attainment be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cancel the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12316.1 in the name of Mary Scanlon is as follows. Yes, 46. No, 61. There were two abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12316 in the name of Angel Constance on raising attainment be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cancel votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12316 in the name of Angela Constance is as follows. Yes, 94. No, 15. There were no abstention. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12319 in the name of Michael Matheson on serious crime bill UK legislation be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12318 in the name of Haley McLeod on the abolition of the Advisory Committee on Pesticides UK legislation be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12320 in the name of Fiona Hislop on Scottish Minister's nominations to the European Economic and Social Committee of the European Union be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.